Chiara Kotokatoa, welcome to day two of our workshop on methods of the Global South. Um, we had some really amazing panels uh, yesterday, and I'm looking forward to uh, building from that. Uh, our first panel today particularly addresses uh, COVID-19 and the nature of methods in the Global South within the context of uh, COVID-19. Once again, we have um, an amazing panel of um, the academics, practitioners, um, advocates who have been working uh, within the context of COVID-19 in the Global South. We have with us uh, today, and I will just introduce you um, across the uh, screen, um, uh, Shuddhabrata Debroy, Uttaran Dutta, Raihan Jamil, Rati Kumar, and Devalina Mukherjee, uh, speaking from different parts of the uh, globe, really. What we will do is we will um, again follow the format that we did yesterday, begin with um, uh, three prompts. And I'm going to start with the first prompt. And um, uh, Shuddha Brata, you're going to be the first one to respond uh, to this. Um, and the prompt is, what are the key elements of method in the context of COVID-19 in the Global South. Yeah. Ah, okay. So am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I think what my focus primarily was or is, uh, is the element of how much work from the community or through the community we can do. And I think based on that, in terms of methods, one of the most key elements that I found that has been working, actually working in praxis in the context of Global South is how communities are coming together. That means how people are coming together, helping each other. Maybe it's in the case like, and it can be by, by multiple means uh, in Kerala for that matter. And I'm talking especially of states which have dealt with the pandemic particularly well. In case of Kerala, it's more in terms of how we look at the pandemic as a means of coming together of people, how the state responds in terms of its own sorts of uh, micro level, micro level interventions in the case of municipalities or uh, other sort of small units like that. So this is, I think, when we look at a pandemic like the present that we have, we also need to understand how can we also prepare ourselves for uh, future pandemics because that's what the predictions are. And so I think in the moment of how we react to this pandemic will also define how we react to other pandemics. So again, if we ask, if you ask me about methods, I think my method probably or the way I see it is that the pandemic has given us an opportunity to look at how our health infrastructure works and how communities can be utilized uh, for bringing in change that probably other bureaucratic measures can't or which has been found that it doesn't work exactly. So how can that be made to work? I think that has been one of the fundamentally most important points that the pandemic or especially the management of the pandemic in the global south has shown to us, be it in India or Bangladesh, Pakistan, anywhere. It has shown to us how bureaucratic measures always are not for the best purposes of the people, but rather what we need to focus on as looking or analyzing pandemics, we need to focus on that particular methodology that focuses on people, on communities and how they come together, etc. Like, yeah, things like that. Thank you, Shuddha Brata. Uh, shall we move on to uh, you, Uttaran and uh, uh, Raihan? Okay. Um, yeah, please. Raihan, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. So first of all, thank you everyone. This is a wonderful panel with Mohan sharing it and I'm seeing so many of you, my colleagues, 
scholars I follow and wait to see you all together. I know it's different time zone across the world. For me, it's a little bit after three o'clock in the morning. So if in the middle of my talk, I fall asleep, you know the reason. Right? Welcome everyone. So the question in, in front of us is about the key elements of method. For those of you who are not familiar with the work that Uttarna and I did here, is we try to explore the concerns and experiences of Bangladeshi migrant workers who are working in the Middle East and uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, mainly Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, that part of the world and the Middle East. And we wanted to see and find out their challenges and struggles during this time of the pandemic. Why was it important for us to know? First of all, of course, Uttarna and I are both uh, Bengalis. So focusing on Bangladeshi population, Bengali population made sense to us. But at the same time, we have both, along with other scholars, been working with migrant population for quite some time now. And so we felt it was a natural progression in our work, in our interest, and it may sound a little bit maybe overused, but in solidarity with the people. I have lived in the Middle East for several years of my life, and I got to witness firsthand the struggles of our Desi men. Right? Uh, with Desi, I'm talking about India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal population, who are actually the working backbone of those regions. So what key elements that we thought were important here? First, that we really thought a key element of digital ethnography that we came across is the authenticity of the voices of our participants. We thought it was very important to talk about authenticity because if we had a face-to-face -face in-person interviews, which is typical of the most ethnographic studies, we felt that there could always be a bias of some sort. Because I'm in person talking to another person, the authenticity, the natural instincts, the natural expressions of our participants may not always come true. Whereas here, when we looked at their social media posts, specifically Facebook pages that had over 10,000 members to one that had over a million members in it, we felt it was unbiased, unapologetic right, expressions of their concerns. Whether our migrant population did not have a job, were worried about the job, were worried about supporting the family members, or simply not being able to even talk to others about their struggles, all came out pretty purely, right? Even reading through those posts, those comments, their feedback, yeah, Uttarn and I were amazed saddened, depressed, angered, like I'm sure Uttar might add a bit more to it eventually, but we had a range of emotions and we thought that came through primarily because of the authentic information we were getting, responses we were getting. This social media additionally provided an avenue of expression for our participants, right? Otherwise, they may not have been able to talk to others, specifically with the restriction of movement, restriction of mobility during the time of pandemic, during the lockdown. People are not even being able to go and see one another who may be living in the same city as them. Right? So communicating with them was an easier way through social media than zero communication at all. And this is how they are culture was formed in the sense this is the culture they're seeing and experiencing and this is what came out in their communication in their social media postings so we really felt that in terms of the key elements authenticity avenue of expression and their own culture was the key aspects of our work mohan back to you
Rati, please go ahead. Rati, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. 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 I'm, I'm sorry. I thought Uttaran and Devalina had their hands up. I'm not sure if they wanted to pitch in. No, let's just keep going and then we can come back. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Mohan. I <clears throat> wanted to briefly talk about the context of my work, specifically in the uh, global south, if you will. So in the past few years, a lot of my work has centered around the idea of uh, some of it by design, some of it by accident, a lot of it has centered around the idea of statelessness, of citizenship, and not necessarily. Um, so I have worked with different refugee populations, both pre and post resettlement in the US and now with uh, resettled, uh, Roh not resettled, uh, Rohingya refugees who are displaced in camps across India. So that is one context. And then the other that I really want to focus on is drawing on uh, what Raihan and Uttaran were talking about as well, this idea of migrant labor during the COVID-19 crisis. So really bringing that context, those two contexts, if you will, uh, to this discussion. What I did want to begin with is not so much a direct answer to what are the key elements of method, but I felt like this was a safe space and a space where all of us have this common understanding of what it means to do this kind of work and what this means, particularly in the pandemic context, that I wanted to share a little something that really came to me this morning. I have, I have you know, I have the, the bulleted points in terms of the key elements that I've experienced in my work. But if it's okay with everyone, I would like to share this, um, not an answer, but this is more a purge if you will, right? I, and the uh, the context for this, Mohan is aware as, uh, and I'm informing him of this now as well, is that one of the community organizers that has been working with CARE is currently imprisoned. And yesterday I found out that this person quite possibly has contracted COVID-19. And so it has been over three weeks at this point where it has been a series of um, phone calls, midnight phone calls, right? Uh, the different time zones, uh, many interactions with folks who are working in the field, who are working through legal avenues, alternative networks, if you will, to try and, to try and find a way to extricate this person from this situation. So this is, uh, this is really some of that experience which has come out. And also based on the discussions that I heard yesterday in terms of the, the distinction between theory and method. Okay, here goes. Theory is method. Method is solidarity. Method is risk. Method is action. Solidarity is telling Western theory to shut up and sit down while those on the ground, in the ground bear the burden of structures on their chest. Solidarity is not found in the blue of the screens. It begins and ends on your keyboards unless you stand up and walk out. Those goddamn NGOs, cowards from convents just like me. Nobody but you cares about data saturation and you can reflect on that when you are dead. I am an apologist for action, for incivility, in reviews, at conferences, in faraway phone calls with my faraway parents. I wonder if our man on the ground will survive the night in his cell. Let me draw solace in my pure Hindu lizard brain. It's all good. He's just a Muslim, an illegal one at that. May only the most pure, the most Hindu, the most Indian survive. May only the best survive. So wake up and write your guilt. Submit, publish, don't perish. Because someone else's blood makes for a killer autoethnography.
So yes, I, I said this was not an answer, it was a purge. And I think that given the, the realities of what is happening in India right now, and recognizing that there are these very real shifting policy structures that have to be navigated. When we talk about method, we really have to be aware about the differences between method on the ground and the linear Western modalities and methods of doing research. So to answer the question in a more straightforward way, if you will, some of what I have been thinking about, and, and uh, Mohan, you talked about this, right? When, when you initially uh, reached out, I had already been thinking about the act of using the legal structure as method. This comes from my background as someone who was trained legally and very ironically as in life, things come full circle. So as having been trained legally, I had very early on seen the constraints of this structure. So what we talk about in CCA, right? In terms of structures being enabling and constraining. I had seen that there was only so much or so far that you could get within legal structures. Again, ironically in the past year, I have been increasingly thinking about uh, critical race theory because again, whether by choice or by accident, there have been these moments where I have hit the wall in terms of being a scholar, a CCA scholar, where I knew that the first part of being a CCA scholar is engaging in active listening, but I have never, unlike Mohan, and that's, that's what I deeply admire about the kind of work you do, I have never been able to make the leap into really going into a policy space or engaging with legal structures. And Shudabrata, I know what you mean when you say uh, it seems like bureauc bureaucratic channels never work, but some of the key elements for me that I have seen, and again, I'm speaking just from personal research experience here. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure this may be incorrect in certain contexts is that we need to think, when we think of the global south, particularly in such a crisis situation, is we need to examine ways in which we can actively engage with these legal structures. We can actively engage with policy structures. And I, uh, again, being mindful of the time, I, I am happy to talk about the specificities of this at a later point is being very mindful of these legal structures and being adept at navigating these locally emergent realities. Second, what can we really do as communication scholars, scholar activists? This is something that I have not been good at doing because I, by nature, I am a fairly private person. So it was difficult for me to do this, but I think I have finally made the leap because there really is no way forward. Otherwise I am going around in circles, writing about the fact that I'm listening, but not doing. And so the second piece really being, how can we mobilize and participate in these formal and informal structures, whether they are academic spaces, whether they are social structures in a way, that forces us to use our privilege. And I know there has been a lot, and the, the, really the last point that I will uh, quickly note here is, uh, this is again something that has been a rethinking, especially uh, within uh, the context of the pandemic, that we can sit and deconstruct our privilege that is, that in itself is a privilege, right? So, so the, the meta idea of privilege is deconstructing your privilege is a privilege because if you are not, and I'm going to use, I apologize, I'm going to use a terribly suburban white example here. But I remember seeing this piece about, you know, Jane Fonda of all people. I said it was going to be suburban, right? Um, she talked about the fact that when she was, you know, when she wanted to get into activism, of course, a lot of people... Uh, suspected her motives for doing it. Eventually there was a time, I think she was married to someone who, who was quote unquote, a real activist. And she talked about withdrawing completely from 
her her role as a hollywood starlet if you will and someone very nicely i think this was someone from the black panther movement right they sat her down and they said that you are a pretty white woman and everyone wants to see you so that is something that you need to bring to the movement now don't tell me that there aren't enough activists on the ground right so when we talk as scholars about privilege and deconstructing it and being humbled by it i think i humbly submit that that is all fine and good but there is it is you know there there is no point there is no point to your privilege being self indulgent if you do not use it for a community cause and the most that you can do is activate your networks the most that you can do and i have mohan i really have learned this from you this ability to fashion support out of seemingly thin air is unbelievable i think that that is something that is a reality in terms of whether we want to engage with bureaucratic structures or not that very often the idea very often citizenship and statelessness and i do not mean just folks who might not be citizens of a country but even those who do not have the rights that should be ascribed to citizens within a country right so when you are talking about low wage migrant labor low caste migrant labor in the context of the global uh, in the context of india or uh, when you are talking about low wage central american workers that i worked with here right quite literally in my backyard where you see that as soon as uh, there is a presidential Uh, or there are presidential executive orders they clamp down and there is no avenue for supporting them anymore unless you are willing to put your privilege at risk i don't know that i am but i think that is something we really should consider when we talk about our work with the global south sorry i won't take more time with this question thank you rati how how powerful you know beautiful uh, reflection and so much so much to ponder upon and that poetry just um, amazing you know and, and and of course you know all of that translates into what are we doing for our community researchers on the ground and um, you know i i really admire the way in which you are mobilizing and coordinating uh, that work on the ground you know uh, debo thank you uh, we, um, uh, come to you unmute can you hear me now yes excellent shall i start yes please go for it okay um okay so um we start from the point of embodiment which i think is part of what pati was talking about and what she's saying is that uh embodiment needs to be put on the line that's what you're saying basically and i i agree with her uh but also right now in india in particular um there are it crosses with all kinds of really strange risks and uh, we are you know you're you've got one example here i can give you a dozen more of all kinds of things that are happening on the field that really really put people at all kinds of risk um and i as as somebody who's living here and doing research here have been trying to work on the types of misinformation that circulate online that is what i've been trying to work on so i i'd like to present um well some small progress i've made about that okay so with all qualitative research i think the position of the researcher and their reasons to do research is a good point to begin it's particularly important in india where the lines and positions have been so clearly drawn in like the past 7 years or so 7 8 years maybe the current dispensation came to power in 2014 um from about 2013 14 i've been participating in on and offline debates about what was likely to happen to this country um if that happened research says that aggression and disingenuousness is more prevalent online than in face to face communication research seems to be pretty consistent about this in various parts of the world we saw this played out in the online space in india which has got uglier over time debates becoming increasingly fraught from about 2016 from what 2016 is when there's a sharp decline in the quality 
of, of the type of online debate that you're seeing. Um, I received my first rape threat in 2017. So one year after it got really intense was when I got my first rape threat. And from 2017 onwards, um, a lot of women I know, not just me, I mean, I'm not just, I'm not some heroic figure, but a lot of women I know who put ourselves into this debate, into these debates online, because um, we wanted to understand what was happening to our country. We received rape threats, threats of murder, threats of violence against our families, uh, not so hidden insinuations that people knew where we lived, things like that. Um, so this is this is a kind of embodiment, right? It is online, so it's virtual. It's a strange kind of embodiment, but it's a kind of embodiment. From about 2019, I have been an observer in ideologically and politically fraught online spaces. Um, I became too afraid to talk, frankly. I mean, once I started threatening my family, I kind of backed off, you know, and then I was an observer. And I've been that way from 2019. So uh, I will kind of present a kind of nascent model today. Um, that is a product of a year and a half kind of concretizing um, the understanding of these online spaces and uh, a desire to map the behavior and attitudes of those who have threatened, you know, my life basically and, and my family and people I care for. So that is the embodied aspect of it. Now we get to the data aspect of it. The desire to map these spaces brought me to the issues of method in data that need to be problematized and thought out in India, right? Because we are researchers, the quality of research we're able to do, the quality of inferences we're able to provide is dependent on the data that we get, right? Um, so data has always been complicated in India. Data has never been easy in India. The first thing about data in India, and you know, I, I work in qualitative research, so um, it's a strange place for me to begin, but having worked in this country for so many years, I can tell you, is we always begin with the numbers, always, right? So uh, we have currently about, 138 crore or 1.38 billion in population. When we talk about access to online space, which is the space we're talking about, we're dealing with proportionately large numbers. In January 2021, India had 624 million internet users. This is January 2021. Facebook had 320 million users. WhatsApp had 459 million users. Twitter had 17.5 million users. I mean, these are just figures way off the grid, right? I mean, there are reasons why, why these, these sort of social media companies are in India. Now, returning to the issue of legitimacy of data, right? In the good old days, which in this definition is before 2015, we used to joke about what we call the Bostala method of gathering data, right? Now, I, can't, I don't have the time to get into it right now, but basically the Bostala method of get, gathering data is extremely inexact. It should not work. It should not work, but it does work because this is this data is gathered from informed sources, right? It, it, it's a strange kind of thing where something shouldn't work, but it does. Uh, but the so the wrong sources in Botswana data were in fact sometimes fairly reflective of what was actually going on. But now, with the crisis of health and governance that you know all of you are seeing around the world because it's being rolled out on television screens and white front pages around the planet, um, data, both qualitative and quantitative, has become a whole different ballgame. Official figure, if official information is very sparse, very opaque, and often wrong by degrees of magnitude. I mean, we're not talking about wrong by 20%, we're talking about wrong by 500%, right? Um, by official estimates provided by the Ministry of Family Health and uh, Ministry of Family Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, 26.8 million have been infected by COVID-19, and a quarter of a million have died. This is the official figure. Um, the meta, the there are unofficial but very credible sources which peg these figures at between three and six times higher. Some, the New York Times actually says it's ten times higher. Right? Um, I point you. Now, the thing is, this is all unofficial, right? The government has not declared any of this data. I do, however, point you to two places for reasonably good data, good data in India. One is the Twitter handle of Bhumar Mukherjee, who is at U Michigan. She's a professor of epidemiology. The second is the Twitter handle of Ashish K. Jha, who is professor and dean of the School of Public Health at Brown. And, uh, and there are other calculations like this. Ashish K. Jha, for example, calculated backwards from commission. 
So projecting, obviously, very large projections, but he calculated backwards from commissions and said, well, the official figures can't be true. Now we're coming to qualitative information. Now qualitative information, I think uh, Puna brought this up yesterday. Qualitative information, even that which is generated as bounded studies, asking very specific questions in specific context, which is what I do, um, is considered here to be largely anecdotal evidence um, from which uh, you cannot draw conclusions that will hold across even small sections of the enormous number of population we're talking about, right? And this is something that I have dealt with in the almost 20 years I've worked here, is so constantly being told, but what is the use of doing qualitative research? So actually I've kind of moved into complementary research because I have to have some numbers to support my claims. So if quantitative data is unreliable, which it clearly is to a very great degree, and qualitative data does not suffice to convince audiences, and particularly policy audiences, then we are left, but then what we're left with is mapping very broad patterns, patterns that are available to us as citizens, right? Because we are no longer in a position where we can trust the type of data that is given to us, and that traditionally carried a certain amount of credibility. We can no longer trust that data. So what are we left with? We're left with mapping broader patterns with the limited information to which we have access. Yeah, so this is a very strange, unstable situation uh, because we are more or less figuring out the truth value. You know, I don't like using the word validity, although I find it a very useful word because it actually means the relationship of something to the real world, right? But I don't like using the word because of the way it's been used in quantitative uh, uh, research. But I, I like using truth value, which is the relationship of what you are uh, being able to understand with, with the reality. Um, is we have to figure out the truth value of what we are hearing for ourselves every single time. And this is a little, this is an enormous amount of mindfulness, of course, as methodology. I mean, you can't afford to lose concentration for even a second because any information coming in has to be sorted, filtered, seen against other pieces of information, seen if it stacks up. If it doesn't stack up, then how does it not stack up, pulling that information back to its source? So it's, an, you know, it's, it's like mindfulness is meta, right? Constantly. Um, and if it sounds, if this process sounds muddy and imprecise, especially to Western audiences, it's because it is muddy and imprecise, of course. But like Bostola research, it also has a kind of internal logic of methodology. It has an internal logic that is culturally placed in this context and that we have evolved because, you know, we haven't had it done. Right? Um, I, I've made a model actually of, of misinformation. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll bring that up with the second prompt. But Mohan, I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you all uh, so much for uh, really um, uh, those powerful uh, uh, responses, all of you. I will just summarize uh, some of the key points before moving on to uh, the next prompt. So, Shuddha Brata, you talked about COVID making visible the context of community, particularly communities as spaces of organizing, mobilizing resources and mutual aid, and situating that in the backdrop of bureaucracy and state bureaucracy. Um, Rati, um, uh, you talked about uh, sort of connected to this you talked about the notion of embodiment and placing the body into those conversations so body in community if you will um uh, raihan and uttaran you also talked about the notion of culture and community the you know, community is a site of expression of culture but also as a transformative uh, space you also talked about the notion of affect um, and centering affect. And, and Rati, you brought up affect powerfully, particularly in terms of thinking through uh, the notion of uh, how do you place the body and use the privilege um, amidst uh, the, the large scale um, onslaught of um, the COVID, but also amidst um, an authoritarian, one might argue a neo-fascist uh, state apparatus um, at work. And, and they both then, you sort of you know brought this neo-fascist uh, state apparatus to visibility rendering it legible by talking about the ways in which the apparatus works uh, through uses of techniques of violence um, uh, techniques of uh, threat and uh, through uses of disinformation 
how then within that of uh, the context do you actually do research acknowledging that what you have as official data right is actually um uh, disinformation that is uh, seeded by a neo fascist uh, power structure what then does even research mean what does it mean to document these number of deaths for instance knowing that these numbers are vastly underreported so think a uh, really great points that you uh, they bring up and this is a nice segue into the next question where i would like you to think about specificities so what are the specificities of method in the context of covid-19 in the global south and perhaps we can start with you um uh, rathi and uh, then go to you um uh, debo then to shuddha brother and then to uh, raihan and uh, uttaran can't hear you rathi now yes this is good yes okay perfect yes. thank you mom i think i would like to add especially from uh, yesterday's panels that we heard also we talked a lot about um, a lot of the scholars on there discussed specific strategies which have become more pronounced in the in the context of the pandemic right so specific strategies which we either did not have not that we did not have access to them or that we were not forced to use certain strategies so if you're talking about a digital ethnography or if you are talking about uh, you know visual methodologies which i think uh, uttaran is so powerful right you you talk about uh, the the legi science method when you are really talking of um, when you're talking about communities where literacy either is not present or oral histories are more predominant so looking at some of those specific ways in which we can engage in communication research so uh, while i am fascinated by all of these different methodologies that have been used in the field that i have used in the field that uh, my colleagues and fellow researchers i know have used in the field for me personally like i said i will come back to this idea of um, moving to the second part if you will of um, and i'm i'm primarily speaking from the the foundation of the culture centered approach here so also recognizing that there are other community based research methodologies but from a culture centered perspective pushing ourselves as a cohort of scholars to take the risk of moving into policy spaces because that also is a part of let me go back for just a second so when we talk about method very often we talk about giving back to the community or we talk about member checking often times member checking uh, in terms of member checking we get that we, we get uh, again validity of our data but that might not necessarily hold as much value for the community yes in terms of ensuring that their narratives are accurately portrayed but in terms i i, I encourage us to also incorporate the specific things that we can or the contributions that we can make to the community as part of the method right and i do not know the ways in which we can unfortunately we have to make the business case for this right within the the new liberal university we have to make the business case for things very often that are not documented or things that are not on paper so we do have to make the business case for how that ties into uh, how that will how irb does not hamstring your ability to do real research right so that very often tends to be and i i remember i have that here because very often that is the case right so if i was to talk to my institutional review board and tell them that already the local contact that i have is imprisoned that throws up a whole lot of red flags for them right but in terms of protecting the person it's it's fascinating because the the university protects itself by really having everything be identified and demarcated and be very linear but i often times think that it is not really protecting the participant and it's also to me 
especially in this kind of research it's a way for it's a way of assuaging white guilt when the institutional review board plays such a large part in and again i i i must stop there for a second and acknowledge the need for these kinds of checks right of course not saying that this is not something that should be there but also that these are not very much in consonance with the realities of what it means to do this kind of research uh, for instance i do not know how how irb would look upon even the suggestion that a researcher is inserting themselves so much into the research right so if you are talking about going into these uh, spaces with activists or going into these spaces where you are uh, in conversations with lawyers or activists or refugees who are on the ground or folks who may be low wage migrant laborers within networks that are distributing food to them how does that then sit with the research methodologies you have to clearly outline in the institutional review board process so i think one again going back to this idea that we must engage with these uncomfortable legal and policy structures and doing that by being ready for these fist fights that often happen when it comes to the institutional review board in the north if you will right and second is making sure that you mobilize in whatever way possible for you or learn to mobilize in whatever way possible uh, the civil society network so if you are connecting with folks who are on the ground or uh, and mohan and i had an interesting experience also with this because it is excruciatingly difficult to explain that you don't have a gatekeeper so i think that is also something that we uh, that i have learned is very often when you look at specific steps in the process there is a gatekeeper letter that you are supposed to provide but when there is no gatekeeper a lot of people don't understand how that research is going to go when you are directly going to the community and you don't have a gatekeeper either who is a either not literate or b not willing to provide that information c for privacy reasons all of those come into play as again i go back to this idea of being aware of the uh, of these emergent issues that occur in the global south when we are doing research i'll i will stop there thank you so much shakti can we go to the next uh, person is that me yes they no. will go for yeah okay. sorry um so in the kind of muddy context that that i'm talking about how do you gauge what types of information may be trusted and what is possibly unworthy about what is possibly unworthy of trust um and you know sort of in my time in dealing with and watching misinformation having a very large contribution in taking this country apart i have evolved basically four factors to four filters for information the first filter drawing on um samsky and herman 1988 actually is uh that you it is the credibility of the source of the information okay now the for the, the problem of course in the modern world is that um there is never a single source there are always self corporations and sort of uh, extensions of the sort of self corporations that that uh, media organizations use uh, so you have to be able to trace all of that you have to know history you have to know affiliations you have to know leaning and most importantly you have to know how the money moves this is the one factor i cannot stress this uh, you know you know more where how is the money flowing where is it coming from where is it going right that's number one number 2a is a kind of triangulation that you do yourself as a watcher as an observer as a member of the audience so the question to ask here is are you getting roughly parallel information from more than two trusted sources or are you getting roughly untrustworthy information from more than two parallel sources so i use the more than two because that works i know people who will not do this unless they get four sources or but that's difficult in today's india um so see the kind of information that you get from particular places um the people they come from that forms a pattern over time 
And if you're watching these over time for about three years now, as I am, you will be able to see if there is consistency and if it stacks up right. And here, you know, yesterday, um, I think Mohu was talking about surprise as a methodological tool. Here also surprise is a very interesting methodological tool because you have these, these kind of, uh, you know, you, you've got these structures that these sources, these people, these places are likely to say this type of thing. And then when you encounter something which is inconsistent, you, your kind of embodied uh, reaction is surprise. How is this happening here? And that surprise is a methodological tool because that tells you that you need to look deeper into this, right? So that's the second thing, triangulation going to surprise. Always checking to see if your experience is of surprise or you are thinking, yes, it is consistent, that such sources will provide such kinds of information to these rules, right? So that's two. Three is informed guesswork or what Malcolm Gladwell kind of calls slice of life, right? So you as an informed individual, are, do you have enough information? Do you, do you, have you done like your, you know, head work? Enough to be able to line up different pieces of information that superficially appear to be very different from each other and discrete and have no connection, but that fit like puzzles and give you clusters and pictures. Are you able to do that? So again, you know, as I was saying earlier, it really comes back to the individual as a researcher, and it is a very embodied thing because you are afloat on a sea of uncertainty. It wasn't like this, but this is how it is now. Okay, uh, so, uh, I, and here, you know, I'd like, to, I'd like to do a little bit of a special case. Um, in India, currently, there is a difference between the scientific view and science. Now, the scientific view is what is espoused by, uh, you know, the mainstream media, which is based on science. Please watch me give, my, give, give the quotation marks, right? Based on science. And then there is science, which is based on science. Okay, the scientific view is, um, is sort of like Hindu science, you know, which is kind of like Trump science. That's the scientific view. And science is like, you know, the boring stuff that people do in laboratory, which, the, which mainstream media really does not take very seriously in this country. So that is where your slicing and your informed guesswork becomes really important. And it is entirely dependent on how much you know and how much you have found out, right? That number four, is the understanding that information is always on a sliding scale of possibility. There is no, is this true or is this not true? It, the question is always how possible is it that this piece of information has verisimilitude, has truth value, right? So you're always on that scale. And very importantly, does this information have a kernel of truth? See, this kernel of truth is very interesting because there are all these debates about kernel of truth. So if you're getting, say, this much information on a bar, right? Okay, there are two questions about this. One is, how much of this is the kernel? The other is, what part of the information you are receiving is based in that kernel? And what part of it is not true? So there are two questions here, and they're both very important questions. And a sort of you know casual case study I do with this in my head continuously is with Ayurveda. And of course, Ayurveda has, uh, you know, venerable roots in this country, and I have benefited from it personally. Many people I know have, but now apparently the argument for Ayurveda and alternative, uh, uh, you know, uh, medicines stretches as far as far as um, drinking cow urine and using Ramdev's coronal. So there's a there's, there's a kernel of truth in the argument about Ayurveda, but the thing it has become now is a whole different monster. So what are the methodological tools you use to excavate that process? Not only the process, but the end product of what it has become, right? So these are the four questions that I find useful um, that I evolved and I use on every, literally every piece of information that I get. Source of information, triangulation, slicing or informed guesswork, and understanding that all information is on a sliding scale of possibilities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Debo. Shuddha Brata, shall we go to you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry for the first question. I'm not a very good initiator of conversation. <laughs> so I just wrapped it up as soon as I could at that point of time. So uh, yeah, uh, especially regarding this question, I would like to focus on a couple of things that both uh, uh, Rati and 
Devo have also spoken about both of them, like especially and also Mohan while summing up, he used the word that I wanted to use, but yeah, because I was taken aback by uh, being asked the first to speak, <laughs> speak, speak, I just sort of forgot that. So yeah, one of the things I'll start by making around five points. The first point is about uh, mutual aid. And if we can use the concept of mutual aid as a methodological tool in analyzing the impact of COVID-19 or community organizing. And I know that has been done for decades now, but the problem, but the issue what I'm highlighting is that if we can sort of take it out a bit more critically, a bit more critically, especially in terms of, again, going back to what I said in the first place regarding uh, bureaucratic state structures and all that, whether we can see the formation of something which is non-statist in nature or non-bureaucratic in nature. But yeah, that, that's a very tangential point that's not even related to this. That's a very tangential point that I wanted to make because mutual aid, as we know, has played a part in human evolution as well. And this pandemic as well, somehow I don't know whether we can connect that philosophically or not. But yeah, that's a bench, like that's something for future research to do. So yeah, getting specifically onto my field work, See, I have been working with a few trade unions across India, both in the north as well as in the east, all of whom have been involved in COVID sort of uh, COVID response, responding to the crisis and uh, all that kind of stuff. Like what I find peculiar or what I find interesting about trade union responses or such specific organizational responses to COVID-19 is that they have the potential to be a lot more among the people rather than our policy frameworks. For example, if a student organization or a union or a community organization, I'll, I, I'll make a segregation between community organization and student and trade unions because community organizations are not necessarily aligned on class or section lines, whereas the other two are. And I see that as a very vital difference to make, especially in terms if one wants to make a, like if one sees the situation as a Marxist, that's what I am. So I'm like, yeah, that's what I am. So I, I'll see this situation as effectively being two very different kinds of organizations. If I see trade unions and other such mass organizations, which work with other sort of mainstream political parties as well as and community organizations. So one of the, sort of demerits that I find with community organizations and one of the advantages that I see with trade unions and organized action on the left is that the organized action will have will, is, will potentially have a lot more impact than normal decentralized community action because the normal decentralized community action doesn't have a political sort of idea on doing what needs to be done is it's like as i think in one of his old uh, talks i know the, he's a he's critiqued a lot within the global south but in one of the one of his talks uh Slavoj Zizek once somebody asked him that do you want to live in a society with no power structure no so he said i don't want to quarrel every day regarding what i want to do so yeah if you mean that absolute sort of total decentralization. If you mean that every day I have to vote for what I have to eat, I don't. So yeah, that sort of thing. So that basically brings us to this uh, politics of what we do across COVID-19 or across the pandemic. So yeah, one of the organizations, especially that the IT unions, which have been working in Kolkata, they have been doing a tremendous job regarding, I think, as far as I know, with the recent times, I think they are even proposing to open their own sort of oxygen bank. And that's all done by a union. So those kind of structures actually still work. And that was a shock to me as well, because as somebody who is sort of trained or who is doing research on trade unions theory, how they have been evolving, that is a tremendous job to do that if in a pandemic, a trade union and a very sort of new trade union, which has come into existence can do this sort of activities like providing oxygen to its members or like giving out help to the broader community whenever that's possible on their part, that's a tremendous achievement. And I think these are certain, some of the specific case studies that we need to focus upon. And 
based on that again something i think this is the point that devo made regarding ayurveda and thing and that process especially in the terms of covid 19 i think we need to look at it from a very sort of if we look at it in a historical process i think what i see in this corporatization or like in this neo liberalization of ayurveda is that it's a very historical process which falls perfectly in line you have a traditional knowledge you have a proto fascist or neo fascist government at power which has been there since 2014 they want to sort of promote so called indian knowledge as well as they want to just bring in the market so the best way to doing that is to fuse both of them and once you fuse both of them you have this sort of very fascist neo fascist and that's like proper fascist fascist <laughs> if they can do that that's like proper fascist force at power where you have the market running for you you have the religious leaders running for you you basically have everybody running for you except a section of the people who will anyway who you can crush if you don't build build resistance still now so yeah covid 19 i think that's what i'll be focusing on when my focus on and my sort of take home point from this disaster that covid 19 has been has been will be how very specific organizations which are very small in number probably they won't have any sort of large political impact in themselves but they are making a political statement so yeah i think that that's where i'll end thank you so much for the brother lot to uh, process there um raihan and um uttaran okay um so um uh, in terms of uh, covid and uh, the work we did in the paper so i had actually talked about that so i'm not going to repeat primarily for one reason i'm not um, uh, a, a person who do a lot of digital ethnography work uh, rather i am a person who work um, in actual ethnography so um, and this is a just a covid reaction when we have a new situation when we have no sites multi site situation we cannot reach people we cannot talk to people in person we cannot travel to our countries so that's why it's a emergency measure and it's a i would say just a rather uh, exception we made uh, in terms of doing a, a digital ethnography in my work so rather i'm going to talk about two more uh, approaches i'm working on right now uh, these are all published so it's not that i'm working on but i just want to talk about two um, pieces i uh, wrote about um doing research in global south especially in the margins of margins because um i worked uh, those who know that i worked with people who are living with less than 50 cents per day and those in fairly um remote places uh, from where you will not get um, usual internet connections or phone connections and etc so uh, those are the areas i visit and try to work with them so from that point of view it's not um uh, uh the suburb of cities or the uh, the villages which have a lot of resources but rather those areas are really remote so from that point of view i am just going to talk about two more approaches which i um uh, want to share with you one is the framework of uh, unlearning relearning and co-learning so basically it is um, every time we are going to do research uh, i think it's not prescription it's whatever i learned it's not something um is uh, new or it's not something which is unique it is whatever i learned i just want to share with that so one thing i just want to talk about is unlearning relearning and co-learning so all the time we need to start a work we need to clean our pages so that the new alphabet can new cultural alphabet new cultural literacy can I I I I strongly believe that uh, we uh, I am uh, when I work with the tribes um, and new tribes I feel that I am culturally illiterate uh, even even if I try to teach intercultural communication that doesn't mean anything here so unlearning is a is a is a process of making yourself ready and then co-learning is those areas where you can learn from them and they can learn from you we all have some knowledge. 
being in academia, we learn something. We can definitely share that with them and they can share whatever they learned and what they know, probably we don't know what, how much they know. Um, because when they become your teacher and, and in, in, in various field work, they actually um, give uh, take workshop like the workshop we did. Uh, so I, I learned a lot of things from them. And then at the end, we start relearning that newer avenues of learning we can explore together. So that is a framework and I'm not going to talk a lot about that. So this is one framework I just want to share. And the, th the second method I want to share here, uh, and this, this one is published in the, not in the communication uh, journals. This is published in a journal called Sustainability, it's an MBPI journal, fairly high ranked. So um, that journal, I, I wrote about decentering my expertise. Um, so basically, uh, so forgetting or kind of um, invisible, um, making yourself invisible and, and making your expertise invisible. That, that makes the expertise and the learning of the people visible in the discursive space. And that's how we can create um, things. And again, one, one more thing uh, here is that as a researcher, I don't consider myself as a communication researcher or something. I'm just a researcher. And more than that, I'm just a human being. I'm just their friend, or they can become my friend. So it doesn't mean that I don't have any label in my, 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 my body or my, so I'm just a person who can be another person with them. And I think that the need of the hour is not doing research, but rather, and then when I say research, people, and, and recently, a um, lot of people are kind of giving me some advice that research is analysis. And research is something you are working on the secondary data. To me, research is an revolution. Research is an opportunity to create new things. Research is an opportunity to create primary data. How can we create community organization? How can we create example, example in the field? So that they can, whenever I leave the field, any researcher can leave the field, they can see that they created those things. It's an example created by people, cherished by people, nurtured by people, and then remembered by people. And that gives them strength. So research is, research is not just analyzing textual data. Research is creating examples. And examples uh, by not blaming anybody, but rather showing them empirically that the, the, the people are powerful. So I think these are the things I am kind of going to uh, contribute uh, to this method section. Wow. There is just so much beauty in this conversation. And I'm going to, you know, you all are so amazing. You fill my heart. And I'm just going to summarize um, what you um, articulated. So, um, you know, let's begin with uh, uh, actually, uh, Rati, did you talk already? We started with you, right, uh, Rati? So um, uh, you talked about, um, you know, uh, this need of, um, you know, working alongside activists, you know, and NGOs and civil society, that becomes very clear in terms of the urgency of your work, right? Um, which also then connects to, in the CCA, we talk about working alongside communities to build uh, regist for, registers for transformative change. And you know, what you're really pointing to is that how do we do that second part, which is how do we take from uh, listening to building the registers for change? Uh, that's where we really need to be working in terms of thinking through how do we build the foundations for community mobilizing, thinking through what is of value to the community and how can communities enact change. Uh, Debo, you talked about uh, the key elements of um, uh, methods in terms of the things that you can do uh, within the question of trust, you know, all the way from looking at the credibility of the source, interrogating the credibility of the source to uh, doing informed uh, um, guesswork, uh, looking at information on a sliding case of possibilities. Your example of Ayurveda is a great one because here you have a traditional system of knowledge, you know, uh, that has tremendous generative capacity, uh, particularly if you think about it within the context of the politics of decolonization and 
uh, uh, the colonial politics that erased, um, uh, uh, you know, the Ayurveda and similar traditional forms of knowledge. And at the same time, um, how it is being mobilized by a proto-fascist apparatus, you know, that uh, uh, Shuddhabrata also talked powerfully about. So I think how you delineate that becomes a really critical question. So how do you approach the question of Ayurveda? Uh, in decolonization work, right? On one hand, um, uh, trying to um, uh, uh, sort of explore uh, Ayurveda as a method and, and looking through what does it teach us about uh, human body, well-being, healing. But on the other hand, recognizing the way Ayurveda is being incorporated into market logics for a majoritarian state in order to actually carry out um, um, it's majoritarian violence. So that's a really powerful example. Shuddha Brata, you know, there is so much um, in what you discussed all the way from talking about the politics of mutual aid. I really enjoyed how you brought in politics into the conversation and how we need to look at, for instance, community organizing within the context of its politics. You know, we certainly see that in a lot of the work of care. Um, in terms of, you know, when you look at indigenous organizing, for instance, in communities, uh, there is a very particular politics uh, that is rights based, uh, that is recognition based, but that actually imagines a, a transformative political system. So what does that look like? And then how does that connect with the uh, question of trade unions? You know, the example um, that you gave in terms of union organizing amidst the politics of COVID, you also pointed out, you know, with the um, uh, trade union examples of these might be unions that are not visible uh, politically in a large scale, but they are doing the political work. So how do we actually understand or learn to recognize those transformative spaces uh, that are there, but that might not be visible? And how do we render them visible and work through that to mobilize for change? And then, you know, I love how you talked about, you know, you went back to the a traditional knowledge example to say that at this particular moment in India's history, it is being organized by forces of the market, by a forces for um, of a, a powerful state to organize into um, um, a fascist apparatus, right? So what are the uh, political uh, possibilities within that context? And I think COVID brings up so much of that, right? There is disinformation, there is hate, there is authoritarian repression as we speak, there are, what, about 30 academics and activists that are currently in jail. And like Rati's example, there are multiple uh, people that are contracting COVID while incarcerated. So it, 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 it takes monstrous proportions in terms of the, um, the capacity of the state to repress. And then Uttaran, you know, how beautiful. You talked about uh, this process of unlearning, relearning, co-learning. You know, there is so much to think through there in terms of creating new language. I go back to yesterday's conversations on how do you build new language, new registers, so that you can relearn together, right? Um, uh, building uh, newer avenues and pathways of learning. And then how do you decenter uh, expertise? I love that um, uh, excerpt where you say research is revolution. Right. So what are the revolutionary possibilities that are uh, brought about through research that give strength to communities by working alongside them, by building strong um, empirically grounded exemplars of people's capacities. I'm reminded of the work that you have done with remote indigenous communities on building hospitals um, uh, health service uh, spaces on um, you know, building these spaces for protecting indigenous trees. Those are great examples of actual uh, lived struggles to create exemplars, you know. Uh, let's move on to the third prompt now. And uh, this prompt is, what are the methodological innovations emergent from studies of COVID-19 in the global south? So here we can focus on the specific kinds of methodological innovations. Um, perhaps we begin this one with you, Uttaran and um, uh, Raihan, then we can go to you, um, uh, Rati, then uh, uh, to you, Debo, and then to you, Shuddha Brata. Okay, um, so this one is uh, primarily about uh, the digital ethnographic side because um, um, 
not the, the overarching uh, methods specific to this particular uh, research. So one thing is that when we, are, we cannot co connect with people online, uh, in person, cannot take interviews, cannot meet them, and look at the people who are uh, suffering from um, the lockdown, the, the, the huge amount of people who live in remote villages, they are actually, uh, they have no work, uh, they don't have any food, um, but still, uh, I don't know if surprising the election result is not reflecting that, um, but still um, we, we, we need to acknowledge their struggle we need to acknowledge their work. So I think the, the, the newer possibility of working is that if we are, so first of all, there should be two limbs, online and offline. So if I just talk about the, the online first, so I think that we need to uh, go beyond the regular ways of doing research because the new normal might be, be, begin a new era of conducting research more on the more emphasizing more on the online aspects. I think uh, the CMC or the computer mediated um, uh, communication can be used here for different social mediated sites. And some of the sites are open, they are public, some of them are um, semi-secret, some of them are completely secret. So we need to have a different IRB methodologies. We need to have different um, interview protocols, we need to have different ways of retrieving data, analyzing data for these uh, few different options and possibilities. Second thing is, I think we need to connect with different other transdisciplinary um, avenues, for example, digital humanities uh, and, and many other, many other um, um, things which are coming from uh, like uh, ethnography and, and English departments and various, every departments are working tremendously, creating their own avenues, own uh, ways of doing things. And I think that in my own work, I, I create apps for illiterate people so that they can be part of the whole um, discourse. So I think um, that's one, one way we can uh, bridge those gaps by creating visual language, sensory language, doodling, audio language. So communication will show the path to talk, uh, to talk to people, to uh, create discursive avenues. We, 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 can, we can bring together uh, all together a new era of creating communication. This is our work. So I think the um, ethnography can begin with that and multimodal research and the transdisciplinary research avenues can, can show us our path. At the same time, in our research, we restricted to Bangladesh, uh, but I think we can go beyond uh, any particular geographical zone because it is not a local experience. It's a global experience, but uh, digital uh, avenues um, create the avenue, uh, create the opportunity that we can still remain local, but we can still connect the global. So that's the one thing, one limb that is the um, online limb. But I think strongly that the offline or the in-person uh, limb need to be strengthened. We don't yet know efficient method of doing research in the COVID situation and the post-COVID situation. For example, we don't know how to maintain the, I think the social distancing is a wrong term. We cannot main, create social distance. It is physical distancing. And we need to teach them that social distancing is, is completely unsocial. So we need to teach them that that is not the way to do research. We have to we have to break the barriers of the physical distancing and create new methodologies, um, maintaining the, the CDCs or anybody's, the medical criteria, not the Ramdev's medical criteria, but the, the, the criteria by, by the knowledgeable people. So, so how can we maintain those and create new methods? And I, uh, my, my sabbatical is canceled because of the Indian situation. So this sabbatical, so the entire six month I was, I was dedicating to create new methods with the COVID and post-COVID situation. I can, I can add that maybe after six months. So thank you so much. And Raihan, if you want to add something. Well, I think Uttan, what you have added and shared is very eloquent. And there isn't much that I would like to add. One thing that does uh, 
remain important to all of our work is i think the sense of or the idea of reflexivity no matter how much future direction we look into i always feel that we always need to keep a constant reminder that we have to look within look inside and be reflective in actually the motives of what we are trying to do and how we are trying to do it i think if we remain going back to what i was saying at the beginning the concept of authenticity if we remain authentic to ourselves and we can only do that through deep and profound reflexivity only then perhaps we can explore new avenues of methodology and also perhaps enhance the existing ones and customize it to the needs of our participants because if we think about it we they are the one assisting us into hopefully moving things forward and hopefully bringing a change we are not doing it for them right so it it should be a very humbling experience and i think if we don't look within then we may not be able to fully realize it thank you back to mohan Thank you so much. Mohan, should I go? Yes, Rati, go for it. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So I think in terms of innovations, some of these, in terms of innovations, some of these are more necessity than innovation. So I have four. I have four key thoughts on what might be considered either innovations or lessons that we should continue going forward after uh, if we can say after covid um the first and again this is speaking from my research experience i know that there are other researchers who have done this uh, work in a much more in depth fashion but the first is really i think becoming an unwelcome researcher if you are a resource that is accessible to the community that you are working with you never know especially in a pandemic situation where you might be that thread of information that thread of support that is needed in the community and there is no way of you preempting that so really the only way is again going back to uh, mohan when you talk about uh, creating these longer term solidarity building processes right that really is the only way to do it to constantly be with the community if you will and uh, specifically uh, again uh, mobile technology is ubiquitous not as expensive and those seem to be the uh, the most commonly used and the, the ones that community members seem the most comfortable with because they provide a a visual way of communication as well as auditory so in terms of specifics i think that the second piece very very important uttaran i think that you mentioned is this idea of connecting across disciplines and again this gets said a lot written a lot but also thinking of ways that we can actively do this right so when you think about someone like paul farmer who talks about this idea of healthcare is not really healthcare it is human care it, it, it extends beyond our very insular understanding of what health means also having said that i think it's important for us and and again this is something that i've been thinking about it's important for us those of us especially who are working on ccs scholarship right we talk about the idea of intersectionality a lot and it's so fascinating to me that i think sometimes we we have forgotten that we got to this point the idea of intersectionality when when kimberly crenshaw talks about it right she is talking as a legal scholar because she was talking about this idea that uh, right when people talked about this concept that racism was irrational and suddenly if we let the uh, you know legislative and legal processes take over that racism would somehow magically be eliminated but really it's not that uh, simple when especially in the indian context as well so i think we should find a way to re connect the concept of statehood and and this is already being done right reconnect the concept of statehood and immigration with the framework of uh, critical race theory and look at and the culture centered approach and really seeing how we can use that as um 
as an interjection into what may be traditionally hands off for a lot of us as scholars, whether we right, maybe because of the ability or the willingness or the risk involved to engage with those structures. So connecting across disciplines, the third very, very key point um, is the, the dissonance. I don't know, this is more a question than an answer. There is a huge dissonance of course, within you know the IRB processes that operate in the global north and the way they operate in the the way real research, quote unquote, operates in the south, uh, but also funding mechanisms, because very often this is something that I have grappled with. Also, not being at a research one university, oftentimes there really isn't much funding available unless it is some, through something like the USAID, right? So really bringing up those questions in these uh, spaces of privilege, of what is legitimate research, what gets funded. Uh, again, that centers around the idea of statehood. So it's very fascinating to me that there are these, right, there, there would be refugees who once they get resettled to the United States, now they have these statehood rights. And so then when you go to work with them, you might have access to funding for working with them, but pre-resettlement, they really haven't been granted that statehood. So you don't really, um, you might not have access to funding mechanisms uh, to work with them. The last piece really is de-reify your privilege. We talk about this, but I think I'm talking about this in a slightly different way where I'm saying, and I'm telling myself this, right? So enough sitting and thinking about deconstructing your privilege. We can only deconstruct it up to a certain point. Beyond that, like I said, I personally, I find it to be a self-indulgent exercise. I would... I urge myself to recognize that, yes, there is a privilege inherent, whether it is caste, class, education, and how you can utilize that privilege once you have, um, once you have mastered it in some ways, if you will. So just those sort of four key points in terms of methodology, particularly emergent in a crisis uh, like the pandemic. Thank you. Oh, Mohan, I, I can't hear you. I'm not sure others can. I can't hear you either. Oh, okay. You're yeah. back. Go for it, Debo. Is it me now? Okay. Okay, yeah. so talking about privilege and embodiedness and putting yourself on the line and um, feeling a little too old now, you know, to really go out there with uh, a large stick. Um, you know, I... What I do is I put myself on the line online. And of course there, I am also feeding off my privilege because I am an upper class educated woman. I speak English in a particular way. I look a particular way and this, thing, this, this information is all available online. And I have used that privilege um, to sort of build this model because this model is a, is, is a sort of product of having huge and sometimes fairly scary arguments with all kinds of people online, right? So if you don't mind, Mohan, shall I just go through the model a little bit? Yeah. I, yeah. yeah, now, unfortunately, I don't have a way to show it. I could do this. Mm -hmm. I'll go through it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's pretty simple. I just do the circuit. Okay, it starts with institutions and structures, okay? Now, with institutions and structures, you're talking about a combination of ideology and profit. Institutions and, institutions and structures are, and this is directly Mohan from the CCA structure, uh, the part about the structure. This is where the misinformation comes from. The misinformation, in fact, and this is an interesting thing about misinformation in India, as opposed to, say, misinformation in the US, because I followed some of that around Trump, too, is that misinformation in India is coming from institutional structures. Whereas a lot of the Trump, misinformation around Trump seem to come from random loonies hanging around in the internet, right? These are not random loonies. These are getting information from mass media sources, from TVs and newspapers, from advertising. The advertising budgets are enormous, right? They're getting, uh, and, and uh, they're getting news from these smaller sort of sponsored organizations like Op-Ed or Postcard News or Swaraj Swarajya. And most importantly in India, and you know, this is something that nobody studies and we really need to talk about it. It's word of mouth and rumor. 
And the reason that is not studied, I am convinced, is because Western, the Western Academy does not treat this kind of data as real data. I mean, really, how do you prove there's a rumor you're going to cite it? Right? And that is, I'm convinced, the reason we don't study it. And it is essential that we do. And of course, it has been studied in the subaltern studies context. I mean, it was done a long time ago. We know that during the first war of independence, they were passing information around in rotis. And this is the first war of independence. But we're still not studying it in the context of communication in India. Why is that? So word of mouth. All right. Then we have the structure, which is the IT cell, right? Where all of this stuff comes. Now, there is a difference between the IT cell and IT cells. There are both kinds. The IT cell is predominantly a right-wing construct. And the IT cell is what uh, women like me are in constant conflict with. There are other IT cells, um, some of which belong to political parties, some of which are sponsored by organizations I'm not sure about because, as you know, information is, is difficult to come by. But uh, there is the IT cell. The IT cell filters all this information and puts it through three major social media uh, venues, Facebook, Twitter, and WhatsApp. Okay, as I, as I already mentioned to you, the sheer numbers of people using these, these sites in India are enormous, right? So these are huge sources of information. Okay, now, so all of this information comes out and it kind of diffuses into the environment. Do you see part of the reason it's so difficult to fight misinformation is because it's kind of floating around. How do you fight something that's floating around? Right? So it, it goes into the environment and at some point, and I don't know when, which is why I'm still working on this, a critical mass of information is reached and a contest begins. So there is a contest in the environment, there's a pushback. This pushback is uh, headed always by private citizens. It's always individuals on the web fighting, you know, trying to get evidence, trying to say this can't happen, that can't happen, that can't be true. And then there is the amazing alt news, to which I, I, I strongly, you know, request all of you to donate actually, because that's what keeps them going. There is Pratik Sinha and alt news, there's a bunch of citizens, and there is some, there is some IT, sort of IT organizations from some smaller organizations and web-based newspapers. You've got The Wire, you've got Quint, you've got News Laundry, you've got, uh, and you've got these sort of uh, side changing things like print. You never know which side they're going to go, right? So you've got a critical mass of information is reached and the challenge begins. And from the challenge comes a process which I have labeled firefighting. Now in the firefighting, what happens is, because there has been a challenge to this misinformation, the sources of misinformation come onto the field like, like a traditional medieval battle. And there is an exchange of arms, which is why I call it firefighting. And the weapons here are very interesting. These are the weapons. Obfuscation, deflection, gaslighting, minimizing. And remember, the minimizing is done not just in these firefighting situations, but also in the misinformation that's coming out. So one classic case study of misinformation, for example, are the twin cases of Rahul Gandhi and Mamata Banerjee. There is actually documentation, or there was documentation, which has disappeared now, which said that there, a lot of money was paid to target these two people several years ago, when the IT cell first began. Now, those documents no longer exist, right? But it is minimizing. You pick certain figures who might be challenging, and you minimize them in the public view. So then when they talk, People are no longer treating them as serious objects of, uh, of uh, value, right? It's a very powerful tool. Uh, misdirection, so when a challenge is made, turning it in another direction, right? Blaming, who is to blame? Is the central government to blame? Is the state government to blame because we're not getting vaccines? They're just passing it back and forth, and we all know who holds the more power, right? Whataboutery, this is something that I think all of you who have been online are familiar with. False gave, uh, claims to credibility, so people claiming that they are econometricians online. Um, I had this particular experience where somebody claimed to me that they were an econo econometrician, and so I asked them, you know, how demonetization is during demonetization. Could they do a calculation for me that would tell me how much demonetization was going to increase household expenses? And they actually sent me a calculation which had only division signs and multiplication signs in it. You know, so it doesn't take much to bust the stuff, right? I mean, I don't have to be an economic person to know that that's not econometric, right? So there are challenges to credibility, to knowledge, to evidence. There is gender-based, there are sexual taunts and rape threats. The number of times I've been called C-U-N-T and, you know, a variety of other things online 
is amazing. And what is even more amazing is how you find the resources within yourself to just push that aside and keep going on. I think that's also an aside, that aspect of embodiment where you're just like, okay, then I will just ignore that and I will move on because I have an argument here. Um, and a very interesting strategy, you know, which I wanted to highlight, which is a sort of twisted mirror to liberal sensibilities. Okay, now let's see what this is made of. Now, liberals, as they are constructed in this worldview, um, liberals are soft hearted and liberals' hearts bleed for everybody, right? So a very good way to contest liberal um, arguments online by the right wing, I have discovered, is to point out to them that somebody else is also suffering. It's a rhetorical strategy. It's the equivalent of um, all lives matter. Do you see what I mean? So when you bring up that somebody is in trouble or there's a structural problem which is causing issues, you are told instead, why aren't you worrying about that? Because that is also a legitimate issue. And in many cases, you will find that the other thing you're directed towards either does not exist or its kernel of truth is extraordinarily small or there is truth in it. But the argument, if you really look at it, is not the same argument at all, right? Um, which moves into, and so this firefighting, which is a very messy space, it moves into a counter narrative. And the counter narrative has relatively few non-right wing players. I mean, by this time it, it becomes a real melee. There's a localization of issues. This is the stage at which um, terms like Bohira Goto in Bengal, for example, which means um, outsider, right? So lines are carved out very cleanly. Do you have the right to talk about this or do you not? Are you an insider or are you an outsider? What qualifies you, right? This is the state at, state at which identity, citizen concerns, there's a lot of passing of responsibility. And then of course we end up in, in sort of where we are right now, I think with COVID, which is the counter counter narrative point, which is where there is concealment. I mean, outright concealment. You know, like the way they are taking the shrouds of uh, the bodies on the, on the riverbed. So uh, drones can no longer take those pictures, right? And just taking sand over them. I mean, that's outright concealment. There's concealment like that. There's also, of course, concealment of information, which is, uh, you know, less difficult, uh, uh, more difficult to photograph. There's a lot of deflection for different things. There is happiness and positivity, which is our new thing. You know, we're supposed to ignore everything and just focus on being happy. There is extended hyperbole. And, you know, I hope to write about it. So I'll, I'll uh, that all the stuff will be expanded then. And of course, there is always the refuge, um, which is violence. There's incarceration, there's FIRs, and all these tools of shutting down, which are turning out to be extremely powerful and extremely difficult um, for those people who still have the courage to speak. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Debo. Should the brother? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so. Yeah, regarding the specificities of method, I think I'll just go over uh, two things. The first thing is that what we are seeing uh, right now is sort of an amalgamation of both the politics of redistribution with the politics of recognition. That was something that Mohan was also talking about when he was talking about the politics of community organizations. And I think that's a very important sort of boundary or an important sort of barrier that we still need to cross in terms of approaching this idea of redistribution versus recognition or what does an effective mediation between both these strategies or both this sort of outcomes effect effectively mean in uh, real politics scenarios but again that's a theme for a broader engagement what covid specifically meant for me was a return back uh, to two things the first thing was that uh, this idea of totality what we mean by totality and whether we can have a very sort of segregated sector-based analysis of events like that and the idea of dialectics. So I'll focus on the totality in this point of time. Uh, something that I think all of the, I think especially Rathi and Devo, what they have mentioned uh, regarding uh, organizing and digital means of like sort of how people are threatened and all that kind of stuff. Uh, previously, I think, and this is directly from Naomi Klein, this is not my data. Uh, 
<laughs> Naomi Klein, when she recounts the history of disaster, uh, she specifically mentions that, uh, and I'm quoting her, uh, that previously disasters were times when people used to sort of come together in solidarity, forgetting their differences, et cetera, et cetera, all that kind of stuff. But today, and this is from Naomi Klein directly, disasters become events which provide if windows into a cruel and ruthlessly divided future in which money and race buy survival. And I think that was the reality in the global north for a long, long period of time when COVID was on rampage in the global north. Whereas in the global south, I think the problem has just started. And based on this, it had also sort of sort of reshifted the focus back on totality because now we effectively mean, effectively know that just sort of reforming the health sector won't uh, solve our worries. If we reform the health sector, we need to reform the sector of logistics. We need to reform our public distribution. We need to reform our bureaucracy. We need to reform how these things actually go to the people. So this is a total system at work. Along with that, I also, I have just noted down, I don't know why I noted down, but it was, I think, because of the roots that I come from. It's also a part of what in the back in the 1910 or 1920s when Lenin was talking about revolutionary internationalism. Of course, we are not in that situation anymore. So I'm not going to romanticize that. But we are actually looking at a time when internationalism has become actually a relevant term again. It was not so four or five years ago, but now internationalism again has become a relevant term. And it has, I think that's one of the specificities of methods that we are now actually living in a time where, where we are actually realizing that it is the totality right where, as Hegel had said long back, that it is the totality or what Lefebvre used to say that the total man, we need to look at an individual and the dialectical relationship that the individual shares with the entire totality around him. And that's, I think, one of the focus that also uh, platforms like CARE also do by bringing in culture to the fore instead of moving a bit away from this essentialism of economics and all that kind of stuff. Because we are especially living in a society where communities are organized not only around class, they are organized around culture, around gender, around different sorts of stuff, different sorts of social attributes, if I can mean, if I can say. So yeah, I think this is one of the things, uh, these are some two or three key points and I know that the time is running out, so I will be very brief. So these are like three things that I, that I specifically sort of uh, interpreted from the COVID response, as well as what COVID has thrown up for social sciences, again, to think about. One is again, totality, thinking about how sectors are connected, how segments of human life are connected, whether whatever we do in our private space is connected with our public space, this relationship between public and private, as well as solving the essential difference that has been what I feel is the basic aim of social sciences for centuries is to look at what relationship and how important the individual is within the broader public domain and how can we reconcile that dialectical struggle between particularity with universality and along with going forward a more internationalist sort of mode of governance. And I think, and this is also something that uh, Geoff Mann and Joel Wainwright have talked about in their uh, book on climate Leviathan, where they talk about that we are living in times where there are four distinct possibilities where we are moving from, where like towards which we're moving from. And we might be moving towards a very sort of Thomas Hobbes how he conceptualized Leviathan and Behemoth and all that kind of stuff coming together. So yeah, I would I wouldn't go I would not go further into that because yeah the time is running out. So yeah, I would like to end it here. Thank you. Have added so much. I just want Breeze. Am I muted? No, you're not. Um. So I'm not going to summarize because we are running out of time, but rather I want to go to our audience to see if anyone wants to pose any questions for this panel. I think we all did such a fantastic job 
that the audience is speechless. <laughs> <laughs> you did do fantastic. <laughs> That's a great way to look at it, yeah. I, if I can very, very quickly add something, I promise it won't be more than like 30 seconds, but this is something that needs to be said. Um, Shuddha Brata, what you said is, is really key here, right? You were talking about this, this time of extraordinary cruelty and particularly from a legal perspective. This I am just aghast at this. There is a piece that I'm working on now where um, it, it makes me think of how Arundhati Roy, right? The, the pandemic is a portal. She talks about that. But yeah. that fascism really, really has in so many ways it's unbelievably ugly face has been exposed when you think about something, whether you think about migrant labor, whether you think about refugees, whether this whole idea of statehood, right? I say this specifically because in the past year, there was, um, there was a move to consolidate all of the labor laws, the, the labyrinthian labor laws that India has into a few more concise acts. And you would have thought that that was a chance for transformation, but it was not really. It was actually used as a way to endanger and completely de dehumanize the, the migrant labor in India, right? As so also, and, and so the Supreme Court itself has not yeah. been very, um, has not been neutral at all. It is completely influenced by the government. And so I think we have to be very, very careful when we talk about community, I think we also need to talk about on a larger scale this idea. We are already talking about this idea of statehood and interna internationalization, right? Because we are looking at solidarity, which has to exist outside of the state structure. I'm very sorry. Can I take a couple of minutes more, please? Yes, yes. Go for it, Devo. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I think one of the questions that those of you who are based in the West need to consider, and I think this comes directly from what Ratu was saying, is, um, you know, the, for a long, long time, India was a fairly free and open space where people could do pretty much what they wanted to do. But now when you put stringers on the field or when you ask people to do certain things, to do research, I think um, as those of you who are in Western ac academia need to consider very seriously what it is you are actually asking these people to do. And what is the situation you're putting them, them in and, you know, as Rafi is dealing with right now, very clearly at an emotional and, you know, cognitive level, what happens when something goes wrong and you can't do anything about it? I mean, I can tell you that I feel deeply powerless here. You know, I'm, I've always, you know, I mean, I, I have a certain privilege here. I mean, I think that's, that's, that's relatively clear. Um, I feel powerless all the time. I mean, I feel powerless about my journalist friends. You know, I don't know when they're going to get arrested. Are they going to get beaten up? I don't know if I'll see them again. Uh, you know, so this is the truth of what is happening in this country. So when you talk about research in this country, you know, I think all of you need to be aware that there are dimensions here now that are very difficult, you know, and that we live day by day and that we don't know what is going to happen to our friends or, or our loved ones who are still out there fighting. I mean, I have friends, I have journalist friends who are going from by, by, by using bicycle to go from village to village to ask people. And I don't know when they're going to be stopped and I'll never see them again. So I think this is, you know, this is a kind of balance. It's a new balance because you've never needed to strike it in India. But this is the truth now. Sorry, that's, that's really all I had to say. Did you want to ask any questions? No, I've got too much to think about. <laughs> but I really enjoyed that, and I'm sorry for being so late. Oh, no, no, no. I got lost. Had a great walk. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, I want to um, sort of, as a way of wrapping up, I want to pick up on something that Shuddha Brata said and articulate it um, uh, within the context of dialectics and methods of the Global South. And I think this is a point to think about. So if you're saying that community is politics, right? Uh, the question is that what is the question of politics? 
um, in resistance to uh, this uh, fascist structure. And, uh, you know, for, for your context, you're talking about India, uh, this phenomenon, of course, is not limited to India. And that's the kind of internationalism that you're talking about, Shuddha Brata. It is also the phenomenon in um, uh, Brazil with Bolsonaro. It is the phenomenon in Philippines. It is certainly, you know, through the work of care, a phenomenon in Singapore. And a lot of it is actually what's happening in India now, I argue in my work, is the exported Singapore model. And in fact, what you will find, and I've said this in my latest book, is that um, sort of the right-wing uh, advisors to Modi, the ones that are that have been to all the right convents, educated uh, at the St. Stephen's, and then with the Rhodes Scholarship to the Oxfords and so basically part of the liberal class very much um, are the um, uh, advisors to Modi having come through Singapore and the networks of training on uh, methods of uh, authoritarian control in Singapore. So within that context, you know, the question really for us as method is that what is the politics of resistance and what does that politics of transformation look like? And it certainly cannot um, relegate to kind of the kind of cultural essentialism that we have seen in um, uh, much of cultural studies or a kind of culturalist postmodern uh, response that fails to actually grapple with questions of uh, dialectic and class and capital, you know. And like Shuddhavrata, I will come back to my Marxist roots and say that what does an explicitly Marxist politics looks li look like? Um, yeah. But one again, you know, that can that cannot stay uh, um, uh, that cannot omit the question of culture. Uh, that is, in fact, um, uh, one of the um, uh, pitfalls of much Marxist politics is that we tend to uh, bypass culture and think about uh, class as the basis of organizing. That's not going to work. So then the question is, how do we recognize the transformative power of communities, but at the same time connected to a politics of change. So I think that's really the question for the long term um, in terms of methods of the global south and COVID. You know, Arundhati Roy, you brought her up. She talks about the pandemic being a portal. Um, and that perhaps is what the portal is inviting us to really think through. And maybe the south will lead that change, you know. Any of you want to respond to that as a, a way to wrap up? It's a nice optimistic note to wrap up on, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> we have to have hope in the darkest of times, don't we? Should the brother you were going to say something? Yeah, Rati, yeah. You were going to say, yeah. yeah. That's just a sort of 30 second point. I think uh, what uh, you summed it up brilliantly more than I could. And especially since I'm writing a paper on this, I think uh, your comments have been very helpful because I haven't been able to sum it all up, uh, like working through different tendencies, like how to sort of bring them into, into one particular boil. And yeah, you are right in understanding that a lot of times, I think one of the major pitfalls of Marxist theory in India, especially with terms to culture, is that we have always seen culture as a tool to organize people, but we haven't actually seen culture as a way of life. I think that's where uh, the basic blind spot of Indian Marxist theory actually falls upon. That we have always seen culture as a tool to organize and bring them into larger sort of class conscious or class solidarity networks or caste solidarity networks, if I take the case of the south of India. But we haven't actually looked at culture as a way of life or whether the people engaged in cultural struggles actually do want to end up in those networks or whether they want to sort of look at that. I think that's one of the major pitfalls that I look at whenever I look at organizations which engage with cultural resistance in, in India and are basically aligned with the left. And that's why I really appreciate the work of Kabir Kalamans for that matter, yes. because they have bypassed that, they don't actually essentialize class solidarity networks, but they actually look at culture as a way of life and take that as a form of resistance. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. I know it's totally time, but may I please say something? Yes, 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 Libo. 
you know, I'm so glad you both mentioned this because uh, you know he seems to have figured it out while he's really quite young, but it's taken me a lot of time, and this is the reason why one of my current research interests is ghost stories coming out of Bengal. Is because I have realized that regardless of what my political sensibilities are, my political sensibilities are built on a certain kind of privilege, right? But narratives that tell the stories of people by the people themselves at an intersection that is extremely powerful in our culture, which is the intersection of life and death. These narratives speak of people in such a way that they, you know, I mean, it's, I, I think these stories need to be read. I think the folk tales need to be read. I think the folk tales are still much more powerful than we think they are. And we don't think they're powerful because of our position. You go out there and you ask anybody out there, which is tell me a ghost story from your locality. Oh my <laughs> God, the story is here. Yes. Right? So, yeah, and, and, and the ghost stories are full of revolutionary possibilities. Oh my God. The whole concept of a ghost is a revenant. A ghost comes back for justice. There's yeah, literally yeah. no other reason for a ghost to come back. <laughs> so, I've given a lot of time there. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> Rati, we're going to say something. Thanks, Debo. If we will never leave at this rate, I think. <laughs> this is fantastic. I love it. I, I love it. I'm just, I'm, I'm controlling myself now. Yeah. In the interest I, of time. I do think we need to wrap up because, you know, the next session starts in six minutes. But thank you all so much. Love each one of you. You're just amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mohan. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mohan, for everything. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye, guys. Lovely session. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>
kind of just got places. Can you swap? Yeah, can I do it? Yeah, yeah. Do you want me to move the computer out of your way? Oh, no, no it's, it's all right. Maybe you can disconnect this for a minute minute. so that it's easy for you to see. Yeah. Or oh, now, I can just see. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. <laughs>thank you for joining us on day two for our session on methods of the global south this particular session is really at the heart of um, you know a lot of what we've been grappling with up here at uh, care with the culture centered approach and it's a fundamental question of uh, land. Um, of course, land as it connects to food, agriculture, uh, but more foundationally with uh, Tinuranga, Tiratanga, you know, the notion of sovereignty. Um, and uh, really thinking through then what does a method look like within the context of uh, community struggles, uh, struggles of indigenous and local communities uh, for land, for sovereignty, and uh, in resisting sort of the neoliberal structures of development that uh, legitimize uh, land grab, often in uh, culturalist uh, terms, deploying uh, various kinds of cultural essentialism. We have with us today uh, two keen, amazing uh, uh, speakers who have both been at the heart of uh, the work with land and agriculture. Uh, we have with us, uh, beside me, 
uh, Nahao Christine Ellis, um, uh, who is a researcher and PhD student at uh, CARE, doing a lot of the work on land rights. And um, we have with us joining from um, India, Dr. Ashwini Falnika, who um, uh, has worked in the Vidharbha region of um, Maharashtra in India that has seen the epidemic of farmer suicides with um, widows of uh, farmers. So welcome um, uh, Ashwini and Christine. So great to have you here. Um, we will have three prompts again for this uh, section. The uh, first prompt, maybe Christine, you can begin. There are just the two of you, so you can um, just switch around with the prompts. The first prompt is, how do struggles for land and democratic recognition shape methods of the global South? Christine. Tēnā koutou e katoa, i te ti, i te tā, huri moi te ao. I belong to the tribal nations of Ngāti Kaufata and on my mum's side and on my dad's side, Ngāti Kahungu Ki Wairarapa. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to be on the panel. Um, I just wanted to firstly acknowledge the battle that took place last night here in Aotearoa. Um, the battle was a celestial battle. Uh, Western science refers to it as the super blood moon, uh, which is a rare occurrence that we saw in our, in our sky last night. Um, I'll reference Professor Rangi Mata Moore's work, uh, Living by the Stars, his book Living by the Stars, who has really um, sought to and is reclaiming a lot of uh, ancient Māori knowledge of how our ancestors uh, were guided by the environment. And in doing so, um, he has outlined that the, the battle that took place last night in the skies is called the Maramakutia. So, um, you know, as in all battles, there are events that um, occur that trigger off another event that lead up to this, to a battle that takes place. And so um, the time pretty much in the past, say month, was a foreboding time, you know, really kind of a ominous, time where the environment tells us you can expect the unexpected and this really set the scene or the climate um, for the battle and the battle was between the marama the moon and fetal and fetal is fetal is i guess you could describe fetal as the deity of the underworld and fetal attempts to quite often in, in, in history, Fetal hasn't succeeded, but Fetal attempts to extinguish the light of the moon and plunge the world into darkness. And so while um, many people last night were, were um, you know, stayed up late in Aotearoa, New Zealand to witness the super blood moon, um, some of us were um, encouraging the moon, I guess, you know, to stand her ground against the, the attacks from Fetal. And um, I just wanted to say also that the three, there were three events that triggered this, uh, this battle last night. And those three were uh, Rako Nui had to be present. Rako Nui is the full moon. Um, also, the moon had to be the closest to the earth. And Thirdly, uh, a total lunar eclipse. So without those three elements, the battle wouldn't have taken place, right? And so just metaphorically speaking, if we think about um, community organising on the ground, I think in terms of method, just drawing from uh, the discussion that took place yesterday and even this morning about the uh, delineating between theory and method, I think... In my view, method is method is a battle. There isn't a battle, it's not a method. Right? So method yeah. isn't a sideline commentary. Right? Method, you're in the thick of it pretty much. Yeah. And um, 
in the past meant here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And, and like, as I said, it's been an ominous time. The climate has, has told us that it's an ominous time, a foreboding time. So in the past two to three weeks, we have had these events that have triggered off something that's just happened in the past couple of days. So firstly, these events that have happened are that the leader of the um, opposition, National Party, has, has, has come out, has, in order to lift her rankings, um, she's targeted Māori, and this is what they do, you know, non-European parties, people, when they're, when they're um, struggling in the polls, they'll pick on Māori, because that, that um, picking on us triggers amongst the supremists in New Zealand, increases their support. Um, so she began that about two, two to three weeks ago in Parliament. She was called out on it by um, a Māori MP who is in the Māori Party. Uh, the Speaker of the House, Parliament, kicked him out. And this triggered some online, um, some videos being posted online. And two to three years days ago, one particular video that was posted online here in Aotearoa incited violence against Māori, called non-Māori to take up arms against Māori in New Zealand. And currently that video is in front of the chief censor because it fits the criteria of, of hate speech laws. And New Zealand's hate speech, hate speech law is really weaker anyway. Um, but such was the um, such was the fierceness of his video that it, that it meets that criteria. And um, just like in in America when there was that storming the Capitol, you know, leading up to that, and people who weren't very clever, you know, um, took photos of themselves saying what they were going to do. Um, that's what this person did online when he shot his video. He shot it in his uh, living room, surrounded by all these um, these um, ob these objects that could be readily identified. So although the police haven't, um, I've checked online this morning, the police haven't made an arrest, but other Māori and non-Māori set to work identifying him, and within 12 hours they had identified him and put that online um, for everybody to see. So... Um, I guess the reason why I'm bringing this up is because it's, it's well, for me anyway, it's interrelated with this foreboding time, uh, the time that the climate, the environment tells us to be aware, to expect the unexpected. And I also think back to when um, Anjum Raman, uh, following the massacres in Christchurch of 51 um, Muslim people, I think back to the time when Anjum Rahman said, she came out after that and said to the New Zealand government and to the police, you know, we've told you multiple times that this was going to happen because we had been monitoring the online hate speech. We knew that this was triggering other people, that this was leading up to this event, but you took no notice. And, um, yeah, I think I'll just, can I just leave it there? Because I've lost my train of thought. Yeah. Yeah, so as of this morning, though, the police hadn't made any arrests of this person, although other people have identified him. Mm. He was masked up, of course, full mask, but yeah, like I said, he left clues mm. as to his identity. You know, it's really powerful how, Christine, uh, you're drawing that example of sort of this kind of white supremacy, mm. white supremacist hate, and connecting it to the broader story. Yes. And, and, and that's powerful in terms of a methodological intervention. Let's, let's sort of build from there and go to you, Ashwini. Um, Hello, Juan. Thank you for this opportunity. And hello, Christine. Yes, so um, I will start with uh, 
First of all, I want to say that, uh, Christine, what you mentioned about how the method of the Global South really is, um, you really have to be in the thick of it. You can't be on the borderlines. It's really something that resonated with me. Um, I will start with um, talking about the two care projects that, um, that I did in um, last two, three years. And one of those was with the farmers and the other one was actually digital margins of India, but that has, a con has direct connection with farmlands and dispossession. So right now, currently in India, farmers in uh, the states of Punjab, Haryana, and Uttar Pradesh are on a massive strike, massive protest against three farm laws. And uh, the three farm laws are, um, they have been phrased in such a way that they are uh, really um, uh, meant for the well-being of the farmers and they are supposed to um, ensure better income for the farmers. However, the farmers who are protesting uh, and these protests have been going on for uh, several months now, uh, since last uh, 2020 November. And the farmers are saying that they want complete repeal of these three farm laws. Uh, here is one of uh, a quote from one of the farmers who is protesting at the site from the National Herald. Uh, the farmer says that several of us came from Pakistan at that time, we lost land and we were given land in compensation. Now, these farm laws threaten our very existence. And the reason why they threaten the three farm laws, threaten the existence of farmers, and uh, that situation really speaks for farmers across the agriculture intensive states in the rest of India. But um, the reason why they uh, threaten the existence of farmers is because um, I will explain one of the provisions in these farm laws. The uh, minimum support price that is guaranteed to the farmers, that was guaranteed to the farmers, is um, according to these laws will be, uh, that provision will be uh, removed, which means that uh, farmers can directly sell their produce to, uh, they can enter into contracts with big agricultural corporations and uh, do their farming for uh, those agribusiness corporations. And in turn, then they will be pre-promised uh, some uh, remuneration and some uh, income for the produce that they will uh, grow. However, the problem here is that uh, it's not that these contracts are unheard of so far. And um, it is very much possible that the, uh, the corporations may back off on the grounds that the produce is not up to the mark, et cetera, which then essentially leaves the farmers completely vulnerable to not getting the promised remuneration. This is just one of the examples in which these farm laws disempower the farmers. Now, through the field work that uh, I conducted in the state of Maharashtra with cotton farmers, who the cotton farmers in Maharashtra are right in the middle of an epidemic of farmer suicides that has been going on since 1997, and it still continues. And um, um, the farmers who, uh, much of the farmers, 85% of the farmers in India are small and marginal farmers, which means that they own less than five acres of land. And uh, farmers also are not, even the minimum support price is not really fetching them enough uh, income for the farm produce, um, which leads them to be severely indebted and the farmer suicides are a result of this severe indebtedness, um, uh, extremely expensive inputs, farm inputs such as fertilizers and pesticides, etc., uh, that are being used in 
uh, modern farming and which then leads these farmers to sell off small portions of their lands or the land gets divided among the siblings and even smaller portions of land are owned by these different farm families. And in order to make the most out of those small farmlands, farmers are putting in more and more inputs into the uh, into their agriculture inputs, meaning uh, fertilizers and pesticides, etc. They are also uh, they converted their farmlands from growing millets and um, you know nutritious food that could feed their families and brought that farmland under cotton farming, which is a cash crop. Um, so uh, the uh, my fieldwork with the farmer widows essentially um, uh, spoke of these various stories. So the farmers uh, 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 explained how uh, they don't even um, earn enough income from their farming um, to feed their family one meal a day. So um, this possession and uh, landlessness here has uh, of farmers in India has multiple uh, uh, facets actually. One is that agriculture has transformed from sustenance-based agriculture to modern agriculture. Uh, secondly, uh, agribusiness corporations have much more say and power over how the farming should be done and they get to decide what sort of inputs farmers use, uh, which has changed the traditional knowledge systems. The currently protesting farmers from Haryana, Punjab and uh, Uttar Pradesh, those uh, have historically also evidenced the Green Revolution, which, was, uh, which took place in the 1960s and which has lent, rendered their lands infertile and full of harmful chemicals and pesticides. So uh, besides the overall state of agriculture um, and agrarian crisis, widespread agrarian crisis in India, uh, there are other uh, aspects of landlessness such as uh, in 2005, India passed the uh, Special Economic Zone Act, which essentially allows um, various business uh, uh, businesses and corporations to um, uh, purchase land in 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 a state, and typically uh, this land would be agricultural land that would be converted and used for setting up businesses. And the farmers who were sustaining on those lands are offered compensations. Um, so, um, um, yes, in, in the recent years, there has also been massive amounts of forest land that has been, um, uh, that has been, which is actually supposed to be a, a tribal reserve, which has been uh, taken away from uh, for various purposes. So the government continues to make various amendments into the Indian Forest Act, which then uh, uh, dispossesses the people living on these forest lands, usually the indigenous communities. So then coming to the prompt that, uh, the question that Mohan posed, uh, how do struggles for land and democratic recognition shape methods of the global South? Um, I believe that the struggles for land and democratic recognition, especially in, um, in agriculture, in the uh, sector of agriculture, reveal the changing political economy of the state and the changing ideas of development endorsed by the state. So here, um, the, the, uh, the endorsed path to development that the state uh, vouches for is really um, setting up special economic zones. So uh, more business, so more encouragement for business rather than uh, sustenance-based agriculture. Uh, this is also evidence. So what does it reveal about the political economy of the state? Uh, it also reveals that in the last um, 
let's say 50 years in 1973 the contribution of agriculture to the gdp of india was a 41% nearly half of the gdp in 2019 though the contribution of agriculture to uh, gdp in india has come down to 16% which uh, also reveals the way in which um, uh, the uh, government thinks of development. So it's not really farmer centric, it's not really agriculture centric any longer, even though India was an agrarian economy. It is more uh, pro business, it is more, um, um, more corporations oriented, and which then uh, forces farmers to also give up their lands for SEZs. Or on the other hand, the other project that I mentioned, the digital margins of India, where um, there were many stories shared during the field work by uh, security persons working uh, at the special economic zones for various companies. So uh, they spoke about how agriculture didn't support and um, they decided to leave agriculture, sell off their agricultural land and then uh, take up the job of a security person for that uh, uh, corporation, for that company. So um, the struggles for democratic recognition and struggle for land, um, which, we, which are going on right now in India really articulate new imaginaries of India that are, and these imaginaries are different from the idea of India, the India that is, uh, uh, that represents the aspirations of the urban privileged, privileged in all senses of the hierarchy. So caste, cla uh, caste class, uh, gender, everything. And uh, the civil society actors. So the idea of India that we see and hear about through all the media and communication discourses, whether it is through uh, the noisy broadcast news media or private spheres of communication on WhatsApp uh, and such other elite circles of communication is not really uh, the India that, uh, um, that, that is inclusive to the people who, uh, who are farming on agricultural lands or who live in the forest and um, Really, many of the uh, privileged Indians see those struggles for land and democratic recognition as the people, uh, as struggles of others. They, they don't really uh, relate to those struggles as though they were part of India. Most of the privileged India really wants to do away with uh, the poorer sections who live on the margins of, uh, of the country. But the new imaginaries that you hear about in uh, through the field works and from the people who are fighting for uh, land rights and uh, who are struggling for democratic recognition, those um, ideas are rooted in caring for land. And this is really uh, what I heard in my field work with the farmers that they spoke about how farmland is like their mother. So it feeds us and therefore you care for your uh, farmland. You don't feed it with chemicals and fertilizers. You don't overdose on that. Uh, these new imaginaries, diff new imaginaries that you hear about in, in the field work um, are also about protecting the biodiversity of the, in that geographical area. Um, and preventing overall preventing exploitation of land and resources. So yes, so that's my response. Thank you, Ashwini. Um, again, you know there is uh, so much to uh, uh, ponder on from that. Um, you know, you talked about uh, within the context of the question of method, then uh, situating method within the uh, broader ambit of law and the legal structures. The farm bills are excellent examples. So the ways in which these laws are written in to expel and exclude local and indigenous communities. You know, you talked about um, the Forest Rights Act in India. It's, it's, it's very similar to 
uh, uh, Maori struggles um, in Aotearoa within the context of the legal structures being written in and written up in ways to actually legitimize the expulsion of people from their spaces of livelihood. You know, that connects to the broader question of political economy. And as you say, uh, the question of uh, democratic recognition and representation, right? Whose democracy? What democracy are we even talking about? You also bring up something in, and within that context, you bring up, for instance, the ongoing struggles against the special economic zones that are formulated as sites of development and um, the capital. And yet these struggles render uh, legible particular kinds of imaginaries, right? You also point about within the context of Vidarbha, for instance, this notion of caring for land. Now, uh, this you see in El Terua. Um, uh, you also see it in uh, other contexts of the global south where the relationship with land as mother, for instance, and needing to care for, offers a register for sustenance uh, that uh, challenges the uh, neoliberal uh, agroeconomic capitalism that sort of has taken over agriculture, right? Uh, and, it, and that perhaps offers a register for thinking about protecting biodiversity, sustainability, because you know uh, there is ample empirical evidence now that this kind of onslaught on the land has actually led to the land becoming vulnerable. So, uh, uh, you know, high fertilizer land uh, that is no longer uh, uh, tenable. You can't grow anything on it because it has gone bad because of the amount of chemicals that you have pushed into it, right? So um, you talked about these as new imaginaries, but these are also old imaginaries, isn't it? So this notion of new and old, it's really interesting as you said. Yes, that is that is very true. That <laughs> I I don't have any response for that right now, but uh, you're right. I mean, it's but um, the other uh, the the um, um, the concern I feel here that, that that the current political climate is also uh, talking about how we want to go back to. Um, the idea of India that you know that we are a Hindu Rashtra and and then constructing some idea of history that um, that's not inclusive. So uh, yeah, I don't know whether to call it new, old, or I mean, I yes, yes, not and, and and the powerful point there, Ashwini, is that and and this is the ultimate paradox, right? Uh, this is uh, sort of a proto-fascist government that uses the language of going back. And mm -hmm. yet it is also one, of course, just like with any proto-fascist governments, totally tied to right-wing capitalist market-based ideas yeah. in a sense, right? So um, this going back is at the same time erasing uh, mm -hmm. people's capacities to actually be sovereigns and have sovereign relationships with land, climate, um, okay. and article justice, isn't it? Yes, that makes sense. So, you know, let me move to the uh, second prompt, uh, which asks, what is the nature of method then amid struggles for land in the global south? <clears throat> um, can I just say, firstly, um, Ashwini, there is, there is a lot of... Um, I guess connection, as Professor Mohana said, between um, some some of the struggles for land here in Aotearoa by Maori and um, those that you have outlined, um, especially in regard to the legislation framework and the way that that really works to continue to dispossess um, Maori from from not only um, access to ancestral land but by being able to utilise ancestral land. So um, we have an advisory group, just um, a local advisory group, about 20 kilometres south of um, Palmerston North End, who have raised to the local government, highlighted that there is a particular rule in the local government's plan that is only targeted at Māori. And so it excludes Māori from being able to build more than one house on their own land irrespective or regardless of how 
how big that the, the land is. And so um, what I've learned from, um, from the community organising on the ground is that, um, and even just in general experience, that when you go to those in power, you know, to, to request either shared power arrangement and democracy or for, for land back or land use rights, um, you know, more often than not, they're not, they're, they're not going to hand that over willingly. So even if you turned up and on your best behaviour <laughs> <laughs> and laid out your, your argument, and these are the reasons why we should have, we should be able to build more than one house on our own land. Mm -hmm. They still won't um, entertain that. And so I think, well, they won't entertain it without a lot of uh, pushback or a lot of battle, I guess, if, if, if you want to um, call it that. So I think for me, for method, from what I've seen is <clears throat> that there has to be a lot of push and, and you need allies in order to do that as well. Because the, the won't, those in power won't benevolently hand that over. Um, and in terms of the nature of the method, um, I think in terms of strategies, um, and it, with regard to collective organising, sometimes those strategies do have to be kept on the down low, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, and in that, I think there's also, you know, that reflexivity to make sure that that doesn't create hierarchy when you're keeping particular strategies on the down low because, you know, you just never know. Um, because that element of surprise always works, I found. <laughs> and um, so if you, if you let that out to one person who tells to another person, another person, and then you've lost that element of surprise. So it's always about being reflexive that uh, when, if creating those types of strategies that they don't perpetuate hierarchy within the community organising structure, if you like. I don't know if that makes sense. But, yeah. yeah. I, can, I, can I ask you a little bit on that question? Because that seems like a dialectic, uh, Christine, in the sense that you want to keep part of the strategy hidden mm. and uh, part of it invisible. To the structure till it actually emerges right to get um, the most impact I and, guess. yeah mm. and at the same time you're saying that uh, yet at the same time you want to do it in a way that it doesn't produce or reproduce hierarchies how do you do that um yeah it's a bit, bit of a hit and miss one i think um I think back to a couple of occasions that I've seen on the ground with people have organised against local government. Yeah. Um, and there can be many different um, strategies that are going on at the same time as well. I think um, if a particular strategy is kept in, in a circle and then once that is revealed, then there's a lot of explaining that has to go on. A lot of explanations that have to happen. Hello. Kia ora. Thanks. Please have you, um, do you know who that is? Did you vet that before? Bring them in. It was a Russian name. Are they out? No. Yeah. Okay. Are you? Um, yeah. So just what, what was I saying? Yeah. So when that strategy is revealed, you know, because it's gonna, it's revealed to everybody, including the structure. Then a lot of explaining has to happen within the community organising group as to why that was the way it was. Yeah. yeah. And you just really need to hope that it worked. Otherwise, why would you keep it secret if it didn't work? Yeah. Mm. So, you know, this whole idea of secret and secrecy as method is mm. really powerful. Uh, 
and then that goes into the element of surprise, right? That, that and particularly in things like land struggles, mm -hmm. you want you do not want to give the structure enough preparation time to anticipate, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, and to block your attempts. So hence the the um the need for secrecy. But you, you really do need to do a lot of explaining afterwards. <laughs> to your collective as to why it went down the way it went down and, and of course if it worked then that's great but if it didn't then yeah don't so, do that again <laughs> so so accountability in that sense is also really vital right yes yeah ashwini yes did you want to jump in and respond to christine and to the prompt Yes. Okay, so it's interesting. Uh, I had I have um, um, so my perspective and my response to the prompt of what is the nature of method amidst struggles for land in the global south. Uh, it comes from uh, I think it comes from more of a um since i am i i was born and brought up in in mumbai and uh, i identify as a um, urban dwelling and with all sorts of privileges you know doing a job in a university of higher education etc um, so my response also i guess comes from that point of view and i feel that um the the struggle uh, the the method amidst the struggle for land in global south uh, lies in creating now this comes from uh, what i observe and what, uh, the kind of media and communication discourses that we have available around us um, i feel that the method uh, amidst the struggles for land uh, land uh, in the global south lies in developing evidence based narrative that can include diverse populations across and within uh, within the countries of the global south under one uh, large rhetorical political umbrella rooted in environmental justice and social uh, social justice so this, I think I'm being a little bit bold in saying that. I don't know. I mean, I would love to uh, hear your thoughts on this, Mohan. But I feel that, um, you know, we, we need a, something that can counter this um, mad aspirational um, narrative that seems to rule all our media discourses that sanction all sorts of um, dispossession. And, you know, uh, just at the beginning of COVID, we saw such yeah. tremendous tragedy of um, migrant, internal migrant workers, um, who are essentially people who left their, um, um, you know, um, uh, farmlands probably back home in small towns and rural area in India. And they came to the cities to uh, make a living. And none, nobody across India was really uh, concerned and nobody really um, you know, seemed to be all that um, affected by that mass um, uh, you know, journey. Uh, taken taken up by these internal migrant workers. And I feel the sanction for that sort of attitude towards everybody else besides the besides our immediate um, circles uh, comes because of the larger political um, rhetoric that seems to be, you know, in favor of a certain idea of development. And we really need, uh, we need that evidence-based narrative because I, and I also say evidence-based narrative because much of the media and communication discourses that we see are so uh, almost uh, willingly, they are creating confusion 
Um, and so in, even with the farmers' protests, um, as soon as they started, within a month or two, the, the confusion that ensued among people around me in my uh, you know, friend circles, etc., were so um, not empathetic towards the uh, protests that you wonder how far it, it, it can go, you know, that, that how, how much can we uh, be unaware of the struggles on, um, on the ground. So, um, so I feel that the nature of method really um, also has to be one of continuous and consistent engagement with people who are living in the marginalized um, sectors in India. And um, it, it can't really be only at the time of protests or only when a certain issue is making news. It can't only be at the time of uh, you know, such upheavals or when these struggles erupt or when a protest is taking place. It, it has to be a continuous and consistent engagement um, and, and there has to be robust evidence-based, uh, you know, uh, narrative that 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 can powerfully capture the uh, the the lived realities and also communicate them with the people who seem to be, uh, you know, living. So I feel that the that in in the eighties and nineties during the during the eighties farmers movement, there was this whole idea of analogy of India versus Bharat. And I feel it's not completely irrelevant yet. Um, um, it's really the, the urban India lives in a different reality and the rest of India lives in, in a different reality. So I feel there has to be that continuous engagement and um, um, evidence-based um, narrative that can you know capture the uh, again the imagination of india that really is seems to be completely uh, uncaring towards the people who really make half of india or probably more than half of india so um, yeah so that's that's my response mm. Thank you, you both. I'm, I'm going to uh, quickly summarize this particular prompt from you both. You know, Christine, you started with um, uh, uh, noting of the connections and the importance for connections and, and seeing the synergies between uh, the Maori struggles for land here and um, uh, the struggles of farming indigenous local communities in India. And you particularly pointed to the ways in which rules in local government are used, right? And, and, and in there, you some pointed out something which I think is powerful is how these rules are arbitrary and um, how they are set in motion in very random ways, right? Which then connects to the point that you're making that uh, when you're challenging these power structures for shared democracy, the power structures are not going to turn over um, the rules nicely. It's not going to take place without uh, pushback. So there is an importance of strategy there, right? And that reflexivity in terms of like secrecy as one example of strategy, how do you um, uh, take the structure by surprise by maintaining secrecy and at the same time, uh, create habits of uh, shared participation and accountability to community. Um, Ashwini, you um, uh, talk about how do we build evidence-based narratives. And this notion of evidence-based is really interesting because evidence is used by the hegemonic structure or the language of evidence is used by the hegemonic structure to actually push these um, uh, fundamentally destructive um, uh, uh, political economies and development policies, right? So how do you actually reimagine evidence uh, to think through evidence-based narratives? You talked about creating almost an architecture or an infrastructure of stoling, telling stories, gathering evidence across spaces, which goes back to um, Christine's point about uh, building connections and drawing through these connections to build 
uh, broader international struggles, which um, comes back to the uh, previous session that talked about uh, the necessity of a kind of internationalism, you know, that is deeply local and emergent from local struggles, and yet connects um, internationally in terms of addressing these political economies. Um, you also talked about the ways in which the media have been incorporated to uh, actually perform this propaganda. So how do you uh, disrupt that? Um, and in, within that context, you said the need for continuous and consistent engagement. Now, something else you know, I noticed in both your accounts is um, how you're demonstrating this dialectic as a continuous process, which is as people are expelled from the land, then they are placed into precarious uh, positions in the global political economy, right? So you have lost your land and then you're working as a security guard um, in a multinational corporation that now sits on that space. So uh, this process of expulsion is also a process of incorporation and creating precarity, you know, which, which becomes very interesting. I wonder if we can sort of use this discussion to then move into our next and final prompt, which is sort of thinking through the methodological imperatives that emerge from struggles for land and recognition in the global south. So what really would you like method to do? Christine, you said that method itself is a struggle, right? So what are the ways in which you would want to put method to use and what are your calls for method as um, it emerges from these uh, struggles for land and recognition? I think um, I'm just reflecting upon the past couple of weeks and um, here in Aotearoa, there was uh, local government all over the country had been deciding about whether to uh, establish a Māori ward in their districts. And so a Māori ward is pretty much like a, an electorate, if you like, a local government. So um, there, were, there are town wards and there are rural wards and uh, Māori over the years have pushed back and said, you know, because we're a min minority, the Indigenous peoples here, that um, even if we all voted, we just simply don't have the numbers to put up our, who we would like to have in, that represent us in local government. And so central government at the beginning of the year around March removed the legislative barriers that, that prevented and established the establishment of Māori wards. So in um, our community, in the Manawatū, uh, the councillors met and first they said that they would defer having a Māori ward until after the next election. So we all know that a deference is pretty much um, a vote against a Māori ward because then the next lot of councillors, officials would, could just defer that to the next time and the next time. And so it took two weeks of collective organising and protests um, leading up until their next meeting where they finally voted in favour of it. Um, what, one of my reflections during that time, you know, and also bearing in mind we were in this ominous time as well, just so happened to be in this ominous time. One of my reflections that for, for my iwi, Ngāti Kaupata, there are, we're a small tribal nation um, and there are, um, say, it's those of us in, in the academy and there are also um, like one person represents each of the marae, which is our our sacred collective organising spaces, and there are 12 in the district. And um, so I think, yes, what was I saying? That really interrogating how often we speak in the communicative spaces. And so um, I think, first of all, recognising that there are people within our iwi that are more um, most impacted or more impacted than others and making space for those that are most impacted to be able to communicate um, or articulate the challenges that they face having 
because they live in the community on a day-to-day -day basis. So there are a lot of us that um, we, we don't necessarily live in the community, but we don't live far away. So we might be mm. 20, 30, 40 kilometres away, but we can go back in and then we can step back out and go back to our own places and then we can go back in and out. So that, you know, that really gives us a privilege. The people that can't leave because they live there are faced with the um, lived experience of day-to-day -day discrimination. So one of the reasons why the councillors didn't want to establish a Māori ward was because over 70% of the people in 2018 of the community voted against it. And so the councillors said, well, we should really take into account the 70 or 80 percent or whatever people that don't want this and so um, those are the experiences that the people on the ground that live there have to face daily right they send their children to schools who are amongst people who have got parents or families that think this way that think that Māori shouldn't have a voice in local government that shouldn't have that are against fair and equitable decision making processes in local government um, so in my view, they're the ones that really um, we need to be um, creating space for to speak. And it's not like they don't want to. Mm. Oh, there's plenty that want to speak. But sometimes us academics and others just take up that space and don't even kind of, I think it's a bit of arrogance, if you ask me. Don't think that um, people on the ground can... can articulate their aspirations or their challenges in a way that's um, I guess that the the, shared, the powers that be the local government people um, would would relate to um, and having said that you know they're a bit fragile you know because <laughs> cause like, they're fragile they can't really take much you know I remember one of the councillors she oh I won't because she goes she's going on about having been followed online and <laughs> that racism works both ways well it doesn't anyway um you she's a european counselor and um yeah they're really just fragile you know, they can't handle too much so i think um some of our representatives don't want to agitate them whereas i'd say go for it to the, you know, the people that live on the ground that have to deal with this day in and day out, you know, they should be able to say it however they want to say it. And if those in power that can't handle that are all tough, don't stand for re-election next time. Mm. Wow. Again, Christine, you know, there is um, um, just so much uh, reflection there. And, 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 and the key point about thinking through the logics of um, how we organize these spaces, right? And who speaks within these spaces, whose voices are heard within these spaces. And then how do we make spaces for uh, those on the ground and especially those who are at the margins of the margins? Um, related, you also bring up another point, which is about strategies of communication and civility and codes of civility, because it thinks, seems like you know, for hegemonic structures, they articulate particular codes in which they will participate, right? So they dictate the norms. And when um, uh, forms of communication fall outside of the norms, that's when they are not heard or can be uh, stigmatized and erased. So, um, you know, this uh, labeling of um, racism operating both ways is an example of that fragility. But it is also an example of how the structure sets up the rules of communication, how it should take place, right? So um, when you say you make spaces for voices of those on the ground, it also seems like it's also making spaces for different kinds and forms and textures of communication. Yes, yeah, very much so. And I, which I have a video of one. So we will, will, we will play that. that. Oh, oh yeah. A yeah. short video and there's two it's one from if you could play the one breeze from front on which was recorded by the media that's a shortened summary and then play it again from behind which is the longer version it's only two minutes let's watch it if that's all right so yeah that's yeah. the first video right yeah and it's video. got stuff down the bottom that's the, me the yeah. news media outlet yeah 
that's the first that's a summary and then we'll watch the full one which is only two minutes from it. somebody recorded from their own phone yeah so just to just give a bit of context this was the second meeting at local government where um maori and um non-maori allies assembled to um to lay out arguments again to the local government officials as to why a Māori ward should be established to bring about fair and equitable decision-making processes in the local government, particularly when the local government is responsible for, um, for land use, for what can happen in the district in terms of land infrastructure. It's really important that um, Tangata Whenua Māori have a say in that. Places of our future, our future teachers, our future farmers, our future doctors, nurses and caregivers, our future tradespeople, our future journalists, our future pilots, our future iwi and central government leaders. And most importantly today, our future Manawatu District Council members. These are the faces of our future and you speak for the community they were born and raised in, but there's one problem. None of your faces are familiar to them. This, these faces show the struggle it is to attend a poorly resourced school just to ensure that their language is kept alive. Yeah. These faces show the pain and hurt provided by a system that was meant and built to protect them. Ka pū te ruha, ka hau te rangatahi. When one net withers, a new one is made. Let that new net be intertwined with these faces. Tēnā rā tātou katoa. So the speaker there, time she's from the Field Advisory Group, and um, she was uh, had brought the youth up to the table of the councillors um, to prove a point that none of them represented the don't look like the youth, um, don't speak their language, uh, Maori youth, and um, certainly don't represent them. And then there's the recording from behind because that's the news media outlet just shortened her speech a little bit. These are the faces of our future. Our future Yes to them. 
These faces also show the overrepresentation of Māori youth arrested and incarcerated. These faces show the overrepresentation of child poverty within this very community. This, these faces show the struggle it is to attend a poorly resourced school just to ensure that their language is kept alive. These faces show the pain and hurt provided by a system that was meant and built to protect them. Ka pū te ruha, ka hau te rangatahi. When one net withers, a new one is made. Let that new net be intertwined with these faces. Tēnā rā tātou katoa. So Tawana is, she lives in the Gildan community. She, like I said, she's part of our advisory group. It was her first speech that she made. Very proud oh, of her. Yeah. Um, and I would say that, you know, that didn't happen. We had to create, uh, we had to push to create space for her to be able to, you know, have a minute of that to um, present her to the, little, to the council members. So I think, um, you know, those of us that do have, have the opportunity to speak regularly on behalf of it and, and amongst our even what I really do need to make space for others. Mm. This is a powerful example of making that space good. Yes. Yeah. Kia ora. Ashwini. Yes, so I think uh, my response to your question is also uh, about um, um, I mean, I completely agree about making space. Um, again, I mean, since currently uh, I um, I'm teaching in a journalism honors uh, program, so I end up thinking more about the media discourses, and I see, although uh, in my field work I was more. Uh, I didn't so much deal with the media discourses so much. But recently, I've been thinking more about those and how they, uh, how news tends to uh, twist up the, um, twist up the, uh, you know, uh, the story to to serve a certain agenda, and that has been really um, uh, troubling for me. And that's in fact where the whole um, evidence based <laughs> uh, or you know, uh, evidence-based narratives came came about because there is so much of fake news and twisting of the voices. Um, so I feel uh, with regards to uh, making space, I think the methodological imperative is really to, uh, you know, reevaluate what we term as newsworthy, how do we, what our news routines are really like, um, um, who, um, so even let's say uh, amid the uh, protests, etc., we end up, um, our news ends up, you know, the reporters end up talking to the uh, uh, the leaders of the protests and not so much, which is where the consistent and continuous engagement on the ground really uh, came from. So I feel that, um, you know, it's, it, it, I mean, the insistence on, um, so what changed me was really um, that ethnographic research that really completely changed my um, understanding of the everyday lived reality of the people. And I think really when I spoke about, when I mentioned about um, evidence, it was really about the evidence of um, the experience of realities on the ground. So, um, you know, so through these, it, it, it really has to be that continuous, um, continuous, um, occupation to and continuous commitment to really um, question at every point. Uh, let's say, for example, we talk about in our journalism syllabus, we talk about 
a balanced reportage. What do we even mean by balance? Um, so those ideas really need to be expanded. And when we talk about balance, we really have to make sure that, you know, those other uh, voices that remain outside of our uh, regular media communication discourses also get an equitable representation. And if, um, um, if, if you know, our uh, news media are owned by big corporations, etc., then what does balance mean in that case that, you know, people who don't really have the means to or spaces to uh, speak anywhere, then creating those spaces really is also correcting the imbalance. So, um, yeah, reevaluating all of those um, ethics that we talk about when we create um, and construct those communication discourses. I think, yeah, that that's that's definitely. I mean, that's my response to what our methodological imperatives should be when it comes to, uh, um, you know, mm -hmm. struggles for land and recognition in, in, in the global south, because it's really the power imbalance that we are talking about here. So the people who don't uh, you know, feature in our regular media and communication discourses should have that space to you know, uh, have a say and you know, their voices really need to be heard. Thank you, Ashwini. So um, your uh, imperatives for method actually connect very well to what Christine was saying about the question of making space and then connecting it to pedagogy and, and, and method as practice and practice as pedagogy in your context of journalism education as you're training the next generation of journalists, right? And really asking on one hand, and this goes back to what Debo was saying earlier, how do you build registers for challenging disinformation? And on the other hand, how do you continue to um, um, insist on uh, uh, this pedagogy that focuses on listening uh, to the kinds of voices that have otherwise uh, been rendered invisible, have been erased, and actually um, uh, rendered useless. It is not as if uh, the farmers aren't protesting. They are protesting with their bodies on the line, literally, right? They have been yeah. camping uh, with their bodies on the line in the face of this um, uh, kind of an authoritarian state. And yet um, in the dominant hegemonic registers, uh, that voice is not registered. So how do we build infrastructures for listening? And that goes back to uh, pedagogy. Uh, how do we address this power imbalance, right? This vast power gap between the media uh, that control these narratives vis-a-vis -vis people telling their stories. You know, the, what you're saying reminds me of the Indian agrarian journalist um, and public scholar, really, P. Saina, you know, who talks about how little of the Indian uh, journalism space actually attends to covering rural news or news of farmers and voices of farmers. It's all focused on urban and development. So how do we even build that space? And I guess a practical question for you for method and pedagogy is that how do you get the next generation of students interested in this kind of storytelling, um, interested in this kind of ethic of the everyday at the margins, when there is a much more seductive uh, narrative of this uh, digital, futuristic, artificially intelligent, smart India of the future, you know? That's, yeah. That seduction seem very different, right? Yes, very much. Um, and it's it's a struggle. It's, it's a, um, I mean, we tend to live in such a bubble that um, it's really hard to, you know, um, I mean, insist even uh, as a as a practice, uh, and to insist that students, you know, uh, do go out and actually, you know, engage with the uh, with their. Uh, I mean, something that that lies outside their immediate surroundings. So, yeah. Great. 
Thanks, Ashwini. I'm just looking at um, um, uh, the question and answer. I do want to open up the space for question and answer. We have the joy of having um, uh, Debashish and Mary with us if you want to ask anything. Um, and then we can go to our online <coughs> audience. No, no, you go to the online audience. I, I have, I mean, really enjoyed listening to you both and I have made a few points, which I, I will actually pick up on uh, at the next session when I have to, rather than duplicate some of the things that I'm, I was planning to say anyway. So, um, so I'll keep that, but you know, some really good points, which uh, I you know, hope to um, build on, but I think we should go on to the online questions. Yeah. Okay. Mary. Oh, look, I really loved it. I, uh, I really, because the, the super moon yesterday, I saw it as I was driving from Oakuni all the way down. It was just so big, so close yeah. to the horizon. And then I thought, I'm not staying out till 11 11. <laughs> um, but I really enjoyed your story, Christine, and, and you too, Ashwini. Look, I, I really like this idea of the voices that do not register within existing communication structures and how does that penetrate? And I loved your example of that face to face in the in the the hui in the with the council uh, i didn't even see that online but i followed the story and i couldn't work out how come one or two had actually changed its mind uh that's why uh, so i thought that was amazing and ashwini i uh, uh, was kind of the cross thing about the digital the, the seduction of the digital media this isn't actually a question at all it's a comment sorry no, uh, please. but I, i'm reminded that seduction promises much but never delivers yes um yes. and so that's really important mm. yeah mm -hmm. anyway so i i'd like devashish i've got all these scribbly notes all over the place that i'm not going to repeat here ask questions <laughs> because i'm i've crossed out all the things i'm going to say this out though yeah. yeah so lovely thank you very much thank you. um uh, anis rahman you have the question anis do you want to jump in and ask that question Okay, you have typed it in. Do you want me to read it? Or, yep, I can see. Go ahead, Anis. Maybe I should just read it. Um, Okay, Ani says, love the videos of resistance from the field. Thanks so much. Recently, the co-leader of New Zealand's Maori party was um, uh, removed uh, for the second time from the parliament after performing haka. How do stories of protest culture like these challenge the international media narrative of Jacinda Ardern's um, um, uh, a government is a beacon of liberal democracy to the world, especially with her commendable efforts to sympathize with the victims of shooting at uh, Muslims. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I have my view, which is that um, Jacinda's positioning is really, you know, doesn't tell the full story of really the historical context of what goes, what has gone on and what still goes on here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. That, that would be my nice response. <laughs> <laughs> so much in the not we see it, yeah. Anybody else feel free to jump in from the audience and contribute to that? I mean, I, I just wanted to echo your articulation, Christine, and, and something that we have often talked about is that uh, we need to be critically reflexive of the narrative of kindness, um, because kindness too comes from a position of power and privilege, uh, who is wanting to be kind, you know, it, 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 it emanates from a space of whiteness and white privilege in terms of 
you know, you, I mean, you, you come from a place of power to be able to be kind and show kindness, I think. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's really funny because we have gone back and forth and I think even, you know, engaging with many activists, they have uh, multiple readings of uh, that particular, because on one hand, you have the really commendable COVID response at a macro level, you have uh, the commendable Christchurch response, uh, but on the other hand, like Christine is articulating, there are deep inequalities, you know, and yeah. I think, I, yeah, picking up on that point, I think there is a significant difference between solidarity and uh, kindness, you know, which is kind of a charitable kind of stuff, you know. So, so it's one thing to have, um, you know, networks of solidarity and quite another to say, to be charitable, you know, and that's where the kindness comes in. And power clearly, as you very rightly said, is fundamental to that. I mean, so, you know, if you have power, then you can be kind to somebody else, but not be kind to whoever you please, because you are dishing out that, you know, the charitable kind of stuff. Whereas that's where I see, you know, solidarity to be different. You know, so, you know, you, you build solidar solidarity with marginalized or whoever, other communities, which is very different from showing charity towards them. I mean, and that's, that's where really power comes in, as you very rightly said. So. Um, so critically, you know, evaluating or assessing the discourse of kindness is important as well. Who's been kind to whom? Yeah. Thank you, Debashish. Rahul, did you want to um, ask uh, something? Uh, yes, I have a couple of points. Um, um, they are, I hope I mean, uh, I hope you're able to hear me. Yes, we yeah. can hear you. Okay, great. Um, um, I just had a couple of points and they're not really questions. They are just, um, um, I mean, I'm, I'm enthralled by these two points in particular from this session. So first of all, thank you both uh, Christina and Ashwini for this very um, fertile conversation. And really the first point that I want to kind of pick up on is, is what Christine mentioned early on and then elaborated on later. I mean, the idea that method is a battlefield. And not only in the respect that you go to the you go to the field and there's thousands of problems that you have to negotiate with, but method itself, the idea of methodology itself is is very much a battlefield, and we have to recognize that it is a battlefield even today. Um, and there is that element of you know wrangling um, that we that we have to recognize and embrace, and because you know. Um, we were talking, uh, we were discussing ev evidence-based research and Ashwini was talking about that and you were talking about how um, integrating stories um, sort of is an avenue for that. Uh, but even as we do that, even as we talk, uh, I would say rather comfortably about this kind of a qualitative, um, um, you know, method in which stories are, are able to be brought in. You know the, the the ground is already being swept from under our under our feet by like this AI RCT and this like pseudo you know pseudo studying of choice <laughs> type of studies that just completely are 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 aiming to 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 generate a knowledge which uh, which really is 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 very um, um, antithetical to what we are trying to do. So I think we really need to recognize, and I think I want to have this tattooed on one of my arms, is, just, is that method is a battlefield. I mean, every NCA, every ICA that we go to, we have to go to all conferences with this notion in our heads that this is a battlefield and we'll have to fight for it. Otherwise, it's just gonna, like, we're gonna lose whatever little we even have today. So um, so just thank you so much, Christine, for, for, for articulating it like that. I think it's very, very powerful and, and, and deeply, deeply impactful. Um, yeah, so that was just, just one of the things. And, and, and I know Mohan sort of writes about it. And so I'll, 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 I'll stop here and, and have him respond or, or, or you respond or whoever. Yeah. Kia ora, thank you for that. I, I'd also, um, you know, like to add that um, I was having this discussion with um, 
some of our collective over the past couple of weeks and we noted how here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, you know, they have these awards and you can you can be made a dame or a sir, you know, something like that for it. And, and not taking away from yeah. the substantive research that, you know, people do in their fields. I'm not taking like that. But we did think, wouldn't it be great if we had some awards that said, you've interrogated the structure. We're going to give you an award for that. You know, like actually using that kind of language, mm -hmm. because using the language of battle in battle, then let's have some awards. That says here's an award for dismantling. <laughs> 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 because the structure itself, the government structures aren't going to give those kind of awards out. Are they? You know, we're not going to say here yeah, yeah, you can have a, an award for calling us out on whatever. No, they're not going to do that. So. Why don't we do it? <laughs> Give people yeah. awards for, for, for dismantling things or for attempting to anyway. Yes. Mm. And part of that, Christine, I think also connects to recognizing the courage um, and uh, sort of the strength that it takes for people to actually stand up to structures. Um, especially if um, sort of structures have the ways of rewarding, even from those within us, from mm -hmm. BIPOC contexts, that it co-ops us by rewarding us and giving us those titles in certain instances, like, okay, um, I can be a good boy and uh, perform according to A, B, and C, and then you hold the reward dangling on my head, right? So uh, how do we uh, dismantle that kind of a reward system that actually works to perpetuate the colonial project, you know? I think if the structure is awarding you, then you need another method. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The more awards from the structure, the more your methods are a bit askew on a bit of array, I think, in my opinion. Yeah. You know? And that the more you're being um, isolated by the structure or targeted, that's a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if I may, like, like it's it's just like you know the, the the white structure always presents the idea of method as a struggle that has happened. It's 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 you know it's 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 history that the struggle of method has happened and we already we have arrived. And this is like the end of history, and we know what the method is, and we're gonna just gonna go ahead with it. Uh, but you're right; like, we 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 shouldn't accept that. We, we it's dangerous to accept that. Really. Yeah. And and it goes back to Ashwini, your point about the the consistent and continued struggle that that the struggle isn't over ever, right? That it has to be ongoing. Uh, that's really powerful. You know, Francine had said something. I'm going to read this out to you, Christine. He said that you deserve one of those awards for being a leader and um, you know working with Maori and fielding challenging the structures around Maori wards. I think Tyana deserves it. She's the one that spoke to the councils. Yeah, <laughs> but thank you, uh, Leon is asking, um, and again, you know, what a powerful question. How do you tally that critique with grant funding? The need to play the game to get funding. Kapai, <laughs> Leon. Yeah. Well, you might not get that funding again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are facing that day in and day out. Right? Yes. First of all, I can speak to that's happening right now. Yes. yes. And, and then you end up, you know, you end up stepping on a lot, lot of uh, uh, toes in the ministry and government and and you know part of that is recognizing that you might not get that funding you know it's in a very real way mm -hmm. so i guess at what point do you decide like you know screw funding you know we have to do uh, whom are we accountable to but then you know when i say this i'm not saying that uh, pejoratively i'm saying that in a very sincere way uh, that there are times when commitment to community voice does mean that you have to say screw funding, you know? Debo? Unmute yourself. 
about this issue of funding uh, okay um, so nobody ever gave me funding to do any, any research i wanted to do beyond Purdue, right um i find i have found at least over the last many years that you form alliances at least that's what worked for me you know you form alliances and you try to uh, you know it's it, it's almost i mean see funding is regarded as an institutional thing we've always thought of funding as like institutions hand down funding right but i have rarely had that kind of institutional situation so all the funding that i have managed to gather to do whatever little and it's very little work that i have done i've done it through alliances through making through relationships with people you know aligning with with an interest that agrees with me and trying to work out if i can get funding through that and again you know like the other you know it's, it's a continuous ongoing process and you very very rarely get to do the things you want to do but sometimes it works i mean that's my experience in india and of course in india you know things are going from bad to worse so but um, yeah i think i mean that's that's a problem that anybody you know who wants to do work that is not rewarded instantly uh, it's ongoing and continuous and there is no end to it that's that's all i have to say okay we are at um uh 1235 here so um i'm going to come back to you christine and you ashwini to uh, give you the chance to say one last sentence as we wrap up uh whew, thanks everybody for listening didn't think that um i could last an hour and a half but yes and kia ora, <laughs> Ashwini, it's nice to put a face to your articles um i just probably the last my last thing would be that method involves conflict and battle and yes i agree with you about getting that tattooed somewhere <laughs> <laughs> kia ora. Kia ora. Ashwini. Hmm. Uh, I I just want to say that it's um, it's it's actually empowering to hear all of you, and um, I think it's uh, I mean yes, method is a struggle, and um, you know um, the. Uh, engaging with the margins is is something that takes consistent engagement oh sorry consistent uh, yeah consistent engagement and commitment but i think what uh, really um, makes this struggle um, worthwhile is that having everybody in it so solidarity is really uh, is is the most important part of of this so yeah. Thank you so much, Ashwini. There is just one comment that came in and uh, we can just wrap up with that. Uh, Anis says that um, a vast majority of uh, people of color academics are not even eligible to apply for funding due to the precarious nature of the contract. And of course, you know, there, there are a lot of precarity involved in terms of even sustaining um, uh, junior academics. How do you do method and this kind of work and sustain yourself and have a source of income that allows you to support yourself and the ones that you care for? And I think those are real questions. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, um, Christine and Ashwini. We will uh, take a break and then be back at 1.30 p.m. Uh, New Zealand time for the next session. Okay. Thank you so thank you much, so everyone. Much.